In this presentation, we will discuss inventory cost flow methods, including first in, first out, last in, first out, otherwise known as FIFO and LIFO, and the weighted average method, as well as specific identification. This will be a long presentation. If you would like to jump to relevant points within it, take a look at the description below, which will have links to those relevant points, as well as a description of what will be included at those points. If you would like to see this information in playlist format, we will We'll also have links to a playlist format as well as links to other accounting topics. Hello, in this lecture, we're going to talk about the idea of tracking inventory and recording inventory, both in terms of the balance sheet as well as the income statement in the format of cost of goods sold. In our example, we're going to be purchasing and selling forklifts, meaning we're going to purchase forklifts from the factory and then we're going to sell those forklifts. That means that forklifts to us will be inventory. They're inventory because we are purchasing the forklifts in order to resell them for the generation of revenue. That's really going to be the definition of inventory, the purchasing of something for the resale of it, as opposed to if we were someone else purchasing the forklift in order to help us generate revenue in another way through the use of the forklift, in which case it would then be property, plant, and equipment. So it's the intended use of the forklift, which will determine whether or not it will be an asset in the form of inventory or an asset in the form, uh, format of property, plant, and equipment. The first question we have here is how are we going to record this forklift on the balance sheet? How are we going to put it on the balance sheet? Will we put it on the balance sheet as one forklift? And obviously we can't do that. We're not going to put it on the balance sheet as one forklift. It seems obvious, but we have to put it on the balance sheet in terms of dollars. In this case, we're going to say we purchased the forklift for $15,000. Therefore, we're going to put it on the books at $15,000. This is similar to any other type of conversion. If we're converting from one type of currency to another type of currency, if we're converting from inches to feet, any units of length, then we have to do that same type of conversion. We're converting here in terms of units to dollars. That kind of conversion can cause us problems, and that's, those are the problems we'll deal with as we go through some of these uh, inventory tracking. The reason we know it's 15000 at this point in time is because we purchased it for 15000 on a free market. We could have purchased it with cash or we could have purchased it with some combination of cash or something like credit, but the purchase price on a free market gives us that $15,000 amount. That's 74200 of inventory reported on the balance sheet in terms of dollars backed up in some way by these five forklifts. Now, the problem happens when we actually sell the forklift. Let's say we're going to sell this one particular forklift to the customer. We know what the sales price can be because we're going to come up with the sales price, and that's not a problem. The real problem is going to be the cost. What, what is the cost of that? How much of this 74200 do we need to reduce it by when we sell that one forklift? And we might say, well, why don't we just take the five forklifts and say it's the total was 74200 and divide it by five and say that one forklift is worth 14840 That is one way we can do it. That's a form of, of averaging the method, but we might do it a different way in this particular case. We might take this 74200 assign identification numbers and say this is ID number one, ID number two, and so forth. That will allow us then to assign specific dollar amounts, meaning that number one costs us 15000 Number two costs us 14,006. Number three costs us 14,400. Meaning we're going to specifically identify, specifically track this information and track it by the actual cost of that individual item. That's going to be called specific identification. If we do that method, then we could say, okay, that particular forklift, number one, the one we sold, that one cost 15,000. If we go to the journal entries, it's important to note that there's a distinction between the cost and the sales price. The sales price might be based on the cost. And so, for example, we might have the cost and have some particular markup, like a 30% markup, and that might be how we come up with the sales price. But note that the sales price is different than what we're typically doing in tracking the costs. And when we move to cost tracking, that often gets lost. So let's just say that we're going to record the sale first. The sale is the 16000 Has nothing to do with the inventory cost in this particular problem. We're going to give that here. We're going to say 16000 accounts receivable. We sold it on account and sales go up by 16,000. Where our tracking comes into play is when we're gonna say, okay, how much does inventory go down by? It goes down by that 15,000 that we sold and the related cost of goods sold will be going up, bringing net income down. So we're gonna say that inventory then is gonna be reduced by that particular item for $15,000 worth of forkliftness and the expense of cost of goods sold is gonna go up by that 15,000 bringing net income down and of course, the sales on the income statement is going to go up by the 16000 so there's a net 
gain of the 1000 net income effect in that case. So now we're saying that that 74,200 is now going to be backed up by our subsidiary ledger, backed up by ID number, backed up by specific identification, adding up the 14,6, the 14,4, the 14,2, the 16,000, giving us the 59,200 in inventory after that sales point. That 59,200 then is, of course, what will now be on the balance sheet. Now, what we've used here is specific identification. The reason we would do that is because the forklifts are fairly large. Uh, we probably don't have a lot of them in comparison to other types of inventory, and they could be different in nature. They might not be exactly the same. They might have different colors and different features. If we were selling something that was completely the same, and we had a whole lot of them, things like coffee mugs or something, specifically identifying all the coffee no mugs like this might be not worth our time. Therefore, we might not want to track exactly which coffee mug we then sell. If we have small things that are going to be all the same, we might want to use some estimating method. And those estimating methods will be things like first in, first out, uh, the average method, and last in, first out, which we'll talk about next time. Hello, in this lecture, we're going to talk about estimating inventory methods, methods such as first in, first out, last in, first out, and the average method. Last time, we talked about specific identification when we were selling the inventory of forklifts. We used specific identification, meaning we had an ID number for each particular forklift and knew exactly which forklift we sold and the cost of that particular forklift. Reason that makes sense for forklifts is because they're relatively large, they could be distinct in nature, and they have a fairly large dollar amount in comparison to other types of inventory. If we're selling something else like coffee mugs over here, we may have a large amount of coffee mugs. They may be all completely the same. And therefore, for us to give them all identification numbers and try to track exactly which mug uh, we sold and the cost of that particular mug may not be a good use of our time. may be better to use some type of estimating method in that case, being first in, first out, last in, first out, or an average method. So let's compare and contrast those methods briefly, and then we'll go into more detail at a later time. In this example, we're going to say that we purchased uh, inventory in terms of coffee mugs. We're going to buy and sell coffee mugs. In January, we bought this many coffee mugs, like eight or something here, at a dollar. Then in April, we bought another amount of coffee mugs, like five more, at 120. Point being that the coffee mugs are going up in price. Even though they're exactly the same, the cost is going up. That's going to be the typical assumption. All else equal, prices go up. Why? Because of inflation. The value of the dollar goes down. The price could go down as well if, for example, the glaze or something, a coffee mug became cheaper. For that, uh, The norm would be that prices go up and then everything would be reversed if prices go down. That's how I like to think of it at least. Then in July, we purchased another uh, bunch of coffee mugs at $1.50. Price going up again. We haven't sold any coffee mugs yet in this particular example. We're stockpiling them, expecting to sell them at some particular point in time. We now have on our balance sheet $23, which would be this number of coffee mugs times $1 plus this number of coffee mugs times $120 plus this coffee mugs times $150. That's the $23 we have on our balance sheet as inventory at this time. We then have a customer asking for a coffee mug. We make our first sale of the coffee mug. We're going to sell them all for $5. That's not the issue here. The issue is how much is the cost of that coffee mug? What's going to be the cost? Is it a dollar? Is it $120? Is it $150? We're not going to use specific identification. I'm not going to say, well, let's see which actual mug was picked here. We're going to first use first in, first out as our first example. And in that assumption, and it is just an assumption, we're going to assume that that coffee mug was taken from this area in terms of $1 being the cost, rather than, 100, rather than $120, rather than $150. This is the most intuitive method for most people to understand because it usually follows what we think of as a normal flow of inventory. We would assume that we would try to sell the oldest types of inventory first, even if they're non-perishable, something like a coffee mug. But it's important to note that this is just an assumption. For example, if we put all the new, uh, all the old coffee mugs up front on the shelf and the new coffee mugs on the back, it is possible for the customer to reach in the back and take the old coffee mug. It's important to note that we are not talking about the actual flow of coffee mugs, although this may mirror what we try to have the actual flow to be, but it is just an estimate. If we have that estimate, then we're going to say that 
the sales price is, is uh, $5. So we're going to say we sold it on an account here. We probably would have sold it for cash if it's a coffee mug. But we're going to sold it on an account. $5 going up for accounts receivable. Sales goes up by that $5. That has nothing to do with our cost. We might have used the cost in order to come up with that $5. But has nothing to do directly with the cost. What we're tracking now is the inventory being reduced in this case by $1 rather than $120 rather than $150 under the first in first out method and the cost of goods sold being the $1. So the expenses are going up by $1. We're going to reduce our inventory by that $1. That means that if we look at what's left, we're going to say the inventory was at $23 minus that $1. We now have ending inventory of the $22 at this point in time under the first in first out method. We could make another assumption though. We could say, well, why don't we assume under a last in first out method that this particular coffee mug that we sold, this first one, was taken from the last batch that we bought, the most expensive batch in this case, at the 150. Most people kind of balk at this one because they say, well, that doesn't really make sense. We would try to sell the old ones first. That might be the case, but you can make a reasonable argument to say, hey, if it's just an estimate, I don't know which coffee mugs we sold. It's just as reasonable assumption to say that a coffee mug down here was sold as a coffee mug up here. Why would we want to make that assumption? Well, in terms of rising prices, we'll see that what will happen is that our net income will actually be reduced. So it's possible that this method came up through taxes, a need, a desire to have a lower net income. But we'll discuss that later. It's a good example in terms of a difference in methods and how a different in method can result in differences on the financial statements and differences in net income. So if we make this assumption, we have the same sale. We're going to say we're going to sell it for $5. The sales price isn't going to be affected by the type of method that we are going to use. But the inventory is now going to go down by $150 rather than the dollar. The cost of goods sold is going to be $150. So the expense is higher, making net income lower. What happens to our balance sheet account? Well, we were at uh, $23 giving us a 2150 that is left in ending inventory after the last in first out assumption. Last assumption we can have is going to be somewhere in the middle and we call that the average. So we can use the average method and we can say, hey, you know what? I don't know which mug we sold. I don't know which if we sold the dollar mug or the 120, the 150. I'm not going to go in there and figure that out. I'm not even going to make an assumption. We're going to say that we sold mugs that cost nah, about 121. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. Now, how do we get that average? It's not going to be adding the 1, the 120, the 150, and dividing by 3. What we would have to do is take the weighted. We'd have to say that uh, we'd have to take this number of cups times 1, plus this number of cups times 120, plus this number of cups times 150, and divide that dollar amount by the number of cups. But we'll talk about that later. What we need to know now is that we can say, whatever we cup we sold, it cost about, yeah, 121. And if we record that then, same sales price. But now the inventory is going down by 121 and the cost of goods sold will be that 121. What's left on our balance sheet then? We had the inventory at 23. That one cup is now bringing it down to 21.79. So the essence of this is that they are estimates. So if we look at just the recap, in terms of rising prices, this is how things will always be. If prices go down, you want to flip everything. Meaning cost of goods sold under uh, first in first out was a dollar under last in first out it's always going to be higher in a period of rising prices when the prices go up as we purchase it the middle area is going to be the average so the average is always going to be in between then we're going to have the ending inventory what's going to be left we want to know both the income statement side cost of goods sold and the balance sheet side what's left on the balance sheet and what's left under FIFO 22 what's left under LIFO 2150 and what is average, it's going to be somewhere in the middle. This is what's left on the balance sheet. Then we're going to say net income. What was the impact on net income? Under FIFO, we had $4 net income. Under LIFO, we had the smallest amount of net income, $350. And under average, we have the amount in the middle at $379. You can see that in a period of rising prices, a normal time period, FIFO actually makes us look the best, meaning our net income is the highest and our ending inventory is the highest. And LIFO, last in first out, will make us look the worst, meaning our net income is the lowest and our ending inventory is the lowest and the average will always be in the middle. If prices went up, all that would be flip-flopped. In this presentation, we will discuss what will be included or should be included in inventory costs. 
So when considering inventory costs, clearly we have the cost of the inventory, which would be included. But there are other components that we want to keep aware of and keep in mind that could be included in the cost of inventory as we record that inventory cost, that purchase price or the amount in dollars of inventory on the financial statements. One is going to be, do we have to pay for the shipping costs? And that typically will have to do with the terms of FOB shipping point or FOB destination. It's going to be a common question that is asked and a common factor in practice that we need to consider if we're saying that something is FOB shipping point, freight on board shipping point, then we're saying that the inventory is trading hands and is the responsibility of the person purchasing or the company purchasing at the point in time that it is being shipped and typically then the person purchasing would be in charge of the shipping costs to get to the point of destination, our warehouse. If that is the case, if we're paying for the shipping costs in order to get the inventory in place, it's the same kind of circumstances as if we are purchasing a property plant and equipment in that we need to include those costs into the cost of the inventory as we would to the cost of property plant and equipment if we were purchasing property plant and equipment. Anything that we had to pay for the cost of basically getting that inventory to us and ready and prepared for the sale should be a cost that is part of the inventory. If on the other hand we're saying it's um, FOB destination, then typically the person purchasing or the company purchasing is not responsible for the shipping costs and therefore it's not an issue. A typical question, however, on a, on a multiple choice question will be on the shipping cost. How do you record the shipping costs? And one of the answers will typically be you're going to record shipping costs as freight expense. And the other would be that you're going to record it as the cost of the inventory. And freight or shipping expense sounds really correct if you paid for the freight. However, you paid for the freight in order to get the inventory, which has not yet been sold. And in accordance with the matching principle, then we uh, can't record the expense or should not record it until we have used that cost in order to help generate revenue. We hadn't used the cost yet in order to help generate revenue. We only used it in order to acquire an asset inventory, which we will then use to generate revenue in the future and then expense that shipping costs as part of the cost of the inventory in the form of the expense of cost of goods sold. A consignment is another thing we want to keep in mind. We might get a couple questions on a consignment and certain types of industries would benefit from this kind of arrangement. So a consignment would mean, for example, if we had someone that had a farm and they were producing wine, then they could sell that wine, of course, to something like a restaurant directly. The restaurant then paying for the wine and then selling that wine to their customers. If that's the case, then the producer of the wine would record revenue at the point of sale. However, it is possible to have a different type of arrangement. It is possible for our producer to go to the restaurant and say, hey, I would like to sell the wine here. If you, if you sell it, great. Uh, you can pay me at that point in time. If you don't sell it, then that's okay. Uh, we won't charge you for it at that point in time. And if that's the case, then uh, we're saying that we're only going to have the wine. In other words, the wine, although it's located at the restaurant, is still the inventory or the property of the owner of the wine, the producer in this case of the wine. And the restaurant is just there to provide um, the sale. And at the point of sale, as they sell the wine, then they would uh, take some of the take you know a cut of that and give the difference to the consignor. So in this case, we're saying the wine producer is the consignor giving the wine to the restaurant and the restaurant has possession of the wine. However, it's not the restaurant's inventory. And that's the key point here. The, re the inventory, although it's located at the restaurant, would be the inventory of the consignor, the producer in this case, of the wine. The consignee is just going to be holding on to the wine and at the point of sale typically we'll get some type of payment of course for the service of the sale transaction and give the consignor the, the uh, revenues for the sale of the wine as well. Next we have the discount, the purchasing discount. Now note this also often gets confused in terms of what is a purchasing discount between the sales discount 
if we're the owner and we're purchasing the merchandise that we are later going to sell, then the vendor that's giving us the merchandise could give us a discount and the terms might look something like this 2 slash 10 in dash 30 meaning we're going to get a 2% discount if we pay within the discount period 10 days otherwise we need to pay within 30 days. If we do take that discount if we get the discounted amount then that's going to affect the inventory meaning if this was the sticker price and that's what we were going to pay but we get a 2% discount we have to then decrease the inventory of course by the amount that we actually paid for the inventory. So we need to keep that in mind to, to reduce the inventory for that discount. When we record that, it can be a little bit uh, confusing because students often get, or we often get mixed up when we have a sales discount and a purchase discount. The purchase discount will reduce the inventory. A sales discount, the discount will go to sales returns and allowances. So this is a common question, common multiple choice. We'll ask about the discount and the journal entry related to it. And it's a common mistake that will happen that we don't, uh, we often miss the fact that we need to reduce the inventory by the amount of the discount. Some other costs that we need to consider would be uh, tariffs. If we have tariffs, we're going to consider those in terms of the cost of inventory if it's related to our inventory purchase. Storage, also something that's going to help us to get the inventory ready for the point of sale and therefore a cost of the inventory. Insurance on the inventory. Again, something that's necessary for us to get that inventory and get it ready for sale. Therefore, it is a cost of the inventory. If we have damaged or obsolete inventory, then we're going to have to go through kind of a thought process and say, well, what happened to the inventory? What are we going to do with it? So it would look something like this. We can say, well, can the inventory be sold? If it was damaged inventory or if it's obsolete in some way, is it still something that is sellable? If we say that it is sellable, then we're still going to include it in inventory, but at a reduced price. We're going to use what they call the conservative principle, conservative principle, meaning we don't want to overstate our books. We want to, we want to make sure that we're basically recording at the lower price, the realizable price, realizable price that we could get on the market to sell that inventory. Uh, if it cannot be sold, then we're going to have to not include it in inventory. We're going to have to write off the loss at the point of time that it's been determined that the inventory cannot be sold. Note that this is a huge component. Uh, all these are huge components, but this one in particular is a huge component to inventory. This idea of the conservatism principle, because note that we typically record the inventory as uh, most assets at the cost of, of the inventory. And if the inventory is damaged or goes down, then uh, that could be one, something that's not as easy to determine. And two, uh, obviously the company doesn't really like the idea of having their inventory be marked down and may not have the best method or know exactly what the realizable price for the inventory that is obsolete or damaged would be. And it could be a significant factor on the financial statements to have these, this inventory be written down to the appropriate price, whatever that net realizable value is. In this presentation, we will discuss the consistency principle as it relates to inventory and inventory assumptions. First, we're going to define the consistency principle and then apply it to an assumption such as the flow assumption, such as do we use something like a first in, first out, last in, first out average inventory system. The definition of consistency principle according to Fundamental Accounting Principles Wild 22nd Edition is principle that prescribes use of the same accounting method methods over time so that financial statements are comparable across periods. So here we're considering the assumptions that we're making with the flow of inventory, those being either first in, first out, last in, first out, or the average method typically for the cost flow assumptions. Because those are assumptions, they do have an effect on the financial statements and therefore we want to make sure that we are consistent in those. Meaning that if we used something such as in year one, a first in first out inventory flow assumption, in year two ideally we would want the same assumption as well as year three and so forth. However, and if we, we do have an incentive, companies often have an incentive possibly to shift 
assumptions such as the inventory flow assumption to do things like increase or decrease uh, their net income in a particular time frame. We can see that if we change the first in first out assumption, remember that as we look at the first in first out assumption as compared to the last in first out assumption, that if there were a period of rising prices, the net income would be higher under a first in first out assumption and lower for a last in first out assumption. And therefore, if we were to switch back and forth between uh, flow assumptions like these, we could manipulate that net income in some ways uh, for whatever purpose we would like. Either companies may have an incentive to try to increase net income to look better on the financial statements, or sometimes decrease that net income in order to look worse, possibly for lowering tax purposes. And of course, from a reading the financial statement purpose, from analyzing the financial statements, from being from the perspective of being able to compare financial statements from period to period, from year to year, then we want consistency. We want those those cost flow assumptions to be the same across time. So that's going to be the consistency principle. Now, could a company ever uh, change their flow assumption? If the flow assumption is thought to be better, if there's some reason to change the flow assumption that is not just to uh, adjust or have the income be uh, different during a time period, but in other words, it's for better reporting purposes, then uh, that would be a more legitimate reason to make a one-time change of a cost flow assumption. But what we don't want to see clearly would be cost flow assumptions changing consistently over time in order to change basically uh, the flow assumptions and the effect on the financial statements, particularly the timing statements on uh, the income statement and the net income due to the effect in cost of goods sold. Therefore, once we have a cost flow assumption, we expect to and want to stay with that cost flow assumption so that we have the ability to compare year to year, month to month, time period to time period. In this presentation, we will discuss the concept of lower of cost or market. We will define this concept first and then see it and talk about how it would apply to inventory. The definition of lower of cost or market according to Fundamental Accounting Principles Wild 22nd Edition is required method to report inventory at market replacement cost when that market cost is lower than recorded cost. So what we're saying here is we have we're talking about the inventory, of course, and we're saying that we have to record it at the replacement cost when that replacement cost that market cost is lower than the recorded cost what we actually purchased it for so this looks like a confusing type of definition however it's pretty straightforward what we're applying here is going to be the conservative principle meaning that if our inventory has declined in value we have to record it at the lower cost we don't want to be overstating our inventory obviously regulations are very concerned about us overstating something when we're talking about an asset and making the financial statements look better than they would rather than understating it. And therefore, what we want, what we want to default to for this concept would be under recording the inventory rather than overstating the inventory. And therefore, we want to record it at the lower of the cost or the market value. To apply that, if you see problems such as this, of course, they're going to give you basically two numbers that we'll have to be able to compare. And it's as easy as basically picking the smaller number. So if we bought it at cost, if this is our inventory, this isn't a, a piece of merchandise. This is not a piece of equipment that we're selling. If we buy and sell forklifts and they are our inventory then, and if we bought that forklift for the 15000 but the replacement cost is only 12000 then we're saying that it went down in value and we shouldn't be keeping the inventory on the books at 15000 which would be the general rule, the default rule, meaning we keep the inventory on the books at cost if the replacement cost has gone down to 12000 It's important to note here that we're not talking about the sales price. So we're not saying that the cost is what we're selling it for. We're not selling our inventory, in this case the forklift for 15 We would have marked it up for something of the sales price. We're talking about the cost of it, what it's on our books for, and we're saying that, well, if it costs 15 and we can buy the same inventory for 12 
then we should be putting that inventory on our books for a lower amount. And if we were to sell it, of course, it's probably the case that there would be a relationship to the sales price. The sales price probably is something that would have to be lower than the original sales price that we would have had when we had bought the merchandise at 15000 But this problem, once again, has to do with how much we're reporting our assets on the books for, which is not the same thing as the sales price. It has to do, typically, with what we bought it for. That's going to be the default. But if we're saying it went down in value, given the fact that we bought this inventory specifically for selling it, if the purchase price went down, then you would think that the inventory has declined in value and therefore we should not be holding it on the books, overstating our assets by keeping them at cost at 15, but putting them on the replacement cost, what the inventory, what the same inventory, the same forklift in this case, would cost if we purchased it at this time. To make that decrease, of course, would make the financial statements look a bit worse. We would have to decrease the inventory, lowering uh, the amount of assets that we have on the books, and record some kind of loss, lowering the net income at the point in time that it is determined that the replacement cost is less than the cost that we paid for the inventory. In this presentation, we will compare and contrast the perpetual and periodic inventory systems as we track inventory through the accounting process. First, we're going to look at the perpetual system, the system we typically think of when recording transactions that deal with inventory. So if a transaction doesn't say it's using a periodic or perpetual system, you probably want to default to the perpetual system. We have here the owner, we have the customer, we're saying that we're selling this inventory, this ink, for a cost of 8450 to the customer. The customer is not paying cash, but paying an IOU to the owner. Typically, under a perpetual system, we break this out into two components. One, the IOU, or the accounts receivable, or sales component the component similar to what would be seen if we were not selling merchandise but a service company. The second component, the separate journal entry we can think of in breaking this out into a separate journal entry, would be the reduction in inventory and the related cost of goods sold, the fact that we're giving the ink and recording the expense related to it. So if we consider those two, then the first journal entry we're going to think of and remove, I would think of it as removing the inventory component as if we were so solely a service company and then think of a second journal entry the second half of this transaction being the inventory component so if we removed inventory in the inventory accounts we would say if we made a sale if we did a service sale then the accounts receivable would be going up by that 8450 and we would have the sales or revenue going up and a service company would just be a different name and probably called fees earned or it would be called just revenue or income. In a merchandising company, oftentimes we, we will see it called sales, but it's just a revenue account and it'll go up. The other side then we can think of, and this is the difference, this is the side that will differ between the perpetual and periodic systems, will be that related to the inventory accounts. So this is going to be what I'll call the cost of goods sold entry. That's going to be the fact that inventory is going down. We gave away inventory, therefore it's going down. And we have a related cost that will be going up, the cost of goods sold. Now the inventory is not going to go down by the sales price. And that's kind of the point, and that's the reason we may use a periodic system as opposed to a perpetual one, is that uh, oftentimes the person making the sale, depending on how sophisticated our system is, may not know the cost. It's not on the inventory itself so unless we have an electronic system that knows the costs or we only sell one particular thing to make it easy to record the cost uh, that's why we will, may use a system that doesn't record the second half of periodic system and just record it at the end of the period at the end of the time period so this is going to be the differing factor if we have a system that's sophisticated enough to record this as we go then we would like to do so because that will be a more accurate system uh, throughout the time frame. If we look at those two transactions, then there's, we're going to analyze these journal entries. This would be the entire journal entry. Accounts receivable is going to go up by that 8,450. Sales is going to go up with a credit of the 8,450. 
This is going to be the part that's related to the sales component. Then we have the cost of goods sold component, which I typically think of the inventory first. Merchandise inventory going down with a credit, 6500 The related expense, cost of goods sold, uh, increasing, bringing net income down. If we analyze this, we can say, okay, what's happening to the assets then with these two journal entries? Remember that this journal entry is the one that is different between the periodic, which we're talking about now, and the perpetual, which we'll talk about in a second. So the assets here are going up by the accounts receivable, and they're going down by the merchandise inventory. So the net effect then in the total assets is the difference of 1950 We got something, we got an IOU, we're going to get cash, hopefully, and the inventory went down. Hopefully we got more, we're going to get more money than the cost of the inventory was that we gave up, the net assets then increasing. The other side, we can think about what's happening to equity or the income statement to net income. We can say, okay, well, sales is going up by that 8450 and the cost of goods sold, what we gave up, the expense related to what we gave, the expense related to the inventory, the cost of that inventory is going up, which brings net income, net income up. Now, this one might be a little bit more difficult to see here because we know that sales is increasing with a credit. Sales has a credit balance. It goes up with a credit. So we're increasing sales. The other side is we're increasing cost of goods sold. Now, that's an expense, and net income is calculated as revenue minus expenses. Therefore, the fact that cost of goods sold is going up is going to bring the net income down. So revenue is, bringing the, um, is going up. Cost of goods sold is going up. But cost of goods sold going up brings net income down. Therefore, we're going to subtract the two. And we have the difference, the increase in net income of 1950 That increase in net income, because net income is a part of equity, will also be an increase in equity. And therefore, uh, these transactions will have an increase in the assets of the same amount as the increase in the equity section. If we look at a periodic system, we can think of this same sale in terms of a periodic system rather than a perpetual one. If that's the case, we're still going to have the first journal entry. We're going to say, okay, we still have the accounts receivable going up and we have the sales going up. But you'll recall the second journal entry we will not have. Remember, if it's a perpetual system, we would also record the second component at the point in time that the sale was made. We sold the ink, we gave away the ink, we got the receivable. You would think we would record the reduction in inventory and the cost of goods sold at the point of sale, but in a periodic system, we do not. We only record the first component. Why? Typically, that would be because possibly our, our system is not sophisticated enough. We may have a system where we have someone like a, like a clerk basically making the sale possibly, and, and, and they only know the sales price. Unless they have a scanner or something that knows the cost of goods sold, they don't know what the cost is and therefore don't have the ability to record it also want to be focused on the selling of it and just giving uh, the change back or completing the transaction in any format that can be done. Therefore, unless there's a, a sophisticated system to record it, usually a digital one, a periodic system might be used in that, in that system. If we do have a sophisticated system, we would want to record this at the point in time of the sale in a perpetual system. If we don't, we can just record the first component the sales and the accounts receivable, which is on the inventory. It's the sticker price of the inventory. And then we can record this second piece, not as we go, not as we record sales, but at the end of the time period, at the end of the night, at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the point in time we do a physical count to determine how much of the inventory went down and how much of the cost of goods sold then should be recorded. So that means that at the end of the time period, we'll do that physical count and we will record this transaction. We'll record the decrease in inventory and the increase in cost of goods sold at the end of the time period. Not for one transaction, however, but for all the transactions, all the sales transactions that happen during that time, whether it be a day, a week, or a month, we'll record all the transactions in one lump sum for the decrease in inventory and the cost of goods sold by doing a physical count meaning uh, we'll say the inventory before the count, we'll, whatever it would be, we're going to say 100000 now. That would include the beginning inventory plus all the purchases because we, we recorded those two. We know what those are. 
And then we're going to do the physical count and we're going to say the inventory per the count in this case is 25,000. Then we can subtract the two and we assume that we sold then 75,000. That would be the adjustment or the cost of goods sold adjustment. Therefore, we would debit cost of goods sold 25 for the 75,000 and credit inventory for the 75,000. Note there's a couple things to note here. One is that uh, we're assuming that this is what we had available for sale. This is what the count was. So the difference then, we're assuming we sold those. It's possible that we had a loss or something like we lost some of them or, or they spoiled or something like that. And uh, so that assumption might not be wrong, but we are hoping that that kind of shrinkage would be small and therefore not a material factor in our recording of this transaction, this second component of the transaction. It's also important to note that as we do the physical count here, and we emphasize the physical count as a necessary part to the periodic system, a part that which if we did not record, we would not know the cost of goods sold or inventory, can lead us to start to think that the perpetual system has no use for a physical count because it does record the decrease in inventory as we go through. And note that that is not true because, of course, there could be something like shrinkage or theft or something like that. In a perpetual system, the physical count will be used in order to double check that the inventory is correct, to check to see whether or not there were problems, problems such as shrinkage, problems such as spoilage, theft, breaking inventory, and it'll be able to uh, pick those components up, those pieces up. In this presentation, we will discuss first in, first out, or FIFO, using a periodic system as compared to a perpetual system. As we go through this, we want to keep that in mind all the time, that being that we are using first in, first out, as opposed to some other systems, last in, first out, for example, or average cost. And we're doing so using a periodic system rather than a perpetual system. Best way to demonstrate is with example, so we'll go through an example problem. We're going to be using this worksheet for our example problem. It looks like an extended worksheet or a large worksheet, but it really is the best worksheet to go through in order to figure out all the components of problems that deal with these cost flow assumptions, including a first in, first out, last in, first out, or an average method and using a periodic or perpetual for any of them. If we could set up the worksheet that would look something like this, then we can set up the same type of format for any of those types of problems. And you can see if you mix and match the fact that we can have a perpetual or periodic system for those three methods, FIFO, LIFO, and AVERAGE, there's actually a, a lot of problems that could be asked that are slightly different in terms of methods with regard to inventory cost flow assumptions. So the format of the worksheet, it's going to be three columns or three separate sections, purchases, cost of merchandise sold, and inventory. When considering the periodic system as, proposed, as opposed to the perpetual system, we don't really need this middle section until the end, until we finally do the final calculation, which is where most problems will probably be focused because that's where the adjustment will happen. Until that happens throughout the time period, we're just going to be recording the purchases, and then we're going to record the what is still there, including what was there before, plus the purchases to see what would be in ending inventory. In each of these sections, we have at least three components, and those components will be the quantity, the unit cost, and the total cost. And we'll have to do a conversion each time because clearly inventory is some type of unit, some types of quantity, that we will then have to apply some type of dollar to in order to get them on the financial statements. In other words, we cannot put quantity on the financial statements. We have to put dollars on the financial statements and therefore convert the quantity of the inventory we have to dollars in some way. We'll have the same thing for the cost of merchandise sold. Once again, this column not being used so much so frequently as in a perpetual system in the system we will be using a periodic system. And then we've got the ending inventory, which will have once again the quantity, the unit, and the total cost. If we have this set up, then uh, this will be workable for any kind of inventory flow a problem generally. And we can put the information into this system and figure out not just the cost of goods sold or not just the ending inventory, but both components of them. So going through this problem, we're going to say that we have the beginning inventory first. 
So this is going to just be the given of most problems. This is where we start. This is where we were at at the beginning of the month or the end of last month. And that's where we will start our worksheet. So we had 100 uh, units. We're just going to put them in the Indian inventory. They're not being purchased at this time. They were purchased sometime before this month, sometime before March. And then we're going to have the unit cost. We're going to say the first inventory we had cost $50. And if we multiply 100 times the 50, we get the 5,000. The 5,000 then is what would be on the uh, income statement, I mean on the balance sheet or the trial balance. And this is the amount that will be on the financial statements. I'm going to repeat that over here and pull it out to the left side because later on we will have multiple rows and we'll want to sum up to see what will actually be uh, the total that will be reported on the financials. So here's our beginning balance. If we were to compare that to the financials or in our case the trial balance in order assets, liabilities, equity, income, and expenses, the zero representing that we are in balance, the debits being in positive numbers, the credits being bracketed, and therefore debits minus the credits equals that zero. Net income net here is a loss at this point where we have no revenue, just expenses, the 500, the 300, the 9,920 being that 10,000 and 720. We, of course, are concentrating here on the inventory which now matches our worksheet. So you can see that this worksheet, this is just the last column of the worksheet, is tying out to what we have on the trial balance. That will be consistently what will happen. And you can compare this to, if we had the accounts receivable here, for example, it has a supporting uh, ledger. All of these accounts have supporting ledgers, including inventory of the general ledger by date. But remember that an account like Accounts Receivable wants a supporting ledger not by date, but also by customer. Who do we, uh, who owes us money? And inventory is going to be a similar way. We want to see supporting data not just by date, but by inventory item. What, what, how many units do we have and what's the cost of those units? Now we're going to go to the next thing that happens, which is going to say we purchased on 35, 400 units at 55. Notice that the last units we purchased were at 50. We have rising prices. That's the problem. And that's the problem because prices don't stay the same even though we're buying the same units. These are the same widgets, whatever we're selling. The inventory we're imagining here, all the same. But the price is going up due to, if nothing else, inflation. Now it is possible for prices to go down, but you want to really think of going up as the norm and then going down being pretty much the opposite when we think of the effect on the financial statements if we know what is happening, if we know the difference in the comparison as prices increase, we can easily just reverse them for the condition where prices decrease. So we're going to say then on our worksheet on March 5th, it's going to be the next item here, we will say that we have 400 units. It's going to start off in the purchases here. We're going to list the purchases separate so we can see all the purchases in its own section. Then we're going to add the purchases over here to the ending inventory to what we already have in the beginning and get to our ending inventory number. So we got 400 units in the purchases. They cost $55. 400 times 55 is the 22,000. Now we're going to pull that information over here to the ending inventory. In order to do so, we will first bring down this number. This is going to be our first layer. We want to have it in the same date range because that'll just make things easier to look through. So we're just going to pull that whole thing down. We just copied this whole thing down here just so it's all under the same date range. We're not copying the 5,000 because that's going to sum up the full layers for any date range. Here for March 1st, here for March 5th, it's not going to just be that. It's going to be that plus this 22, which we will now put in the ending inventory as well. So we're going to move that over and copy it over here. So there is some repetition here, of course. We have to copy this over and copy this over, but by so doing that, we can have everything on this date line and we can show the purchases in a separate column so that we can clearly see the purchases column and the cost of goods sold column. Then we're just going to add up these, these two outer numbers under this date line. So remember, we only care now about everything under this green line. That's all that matters at this point in time. We got the 5,000 plus the 22,000 means we've got 27,000. So we have two layers of inventory now under first in first out we've got the 100 units at 50 we've got the 400 units at 55 under first in first out we would assume that we sell the 100 units first although remember 
that's just an assumption. The, the people purchasing could purchase any unit they want because possibly we haven't even uh, labeled them uh, uh, to be able to distinguish which is which. We're just assuming that the, the first units we're going to sell first. Then if we did the journal entry behind this, we would say, okay, now we're going to record the journal entry for this purchase here that we made, this purchase here, and see what happens in terms of transactions. It's important to tie this worksheet out to the financial statements here. So we're going to say, okay, here's the inventory. It has a debit balance of 5000 We bought 22000 more of inventory. Note this is not an estimate. This is going to be the same whether we use FIFO, LIFO, average, specific identification, perpetual, periodic system, under any of those methods. Always the same, not an estimate. It went up for whatever it's going to go up for. We're going to pay 22000 Because it has a debit, we'll do the same thing to it, another debit. So we'll debit inventory. We're going to assume we didn't pay cash but purchased it on account, and therefore cash will not be decreasing. The good thing's not going down. The bad thing's going up. We owe accounts payable. So accounts payable has a credit balance. We're going to make it go up doing the same thing to it, another credit. So if we post this, and if we post this to our worksheet, we have the 5000 plus the 22000 giving us 27000 Then we post this accounts payable to our worksheet. We've got the 12150 plus the 22000 meaning we owe now 34150 So if we were to see that all together, then here's all the numbers filled out. This is our beginning balance worksheet. Here's our adjustment that we made. Here's where we end up. Here's the ending balance after that adjustment. We can see that the 27,000 here matches what is on our worksheet. So it supports, the worksheet supports what is on the financial statements, what is on our trial balance. Note there's no effect on net income, even though we purchased inventory. We're not going to expense inventory at the point of purchase. We will expense it when we consume it in order to help us generate revenue in the form of cost of goods sold. However, we won't make that adjustment under a periodic system until the end of the period, the end of the month, the end of March in this case. Next item, we're going to say that there was a sale of 420 units at $85. Now note what we're not showing here here. We're not showing the worksheet for the cost worksheet because under a periodic system, we only record the, the sales component of it. We're not going to record the related cost component until the end of the period, until we do a physical count. This is really the difference between the two methods in terms of the transactions as we go through the period. So in terms of a periodic system, we will record the journal entry, but nothing will be recorded to the inventory accounts. Nothing will be reported to the new accounts when we go from a service company to a merchandising company, those accounts of inventory and cost of goods sold. What we will record is the first half of the transaction that we typically think of when we make a sale of inventory. The transaction that would be the same in, in many respects, in all respects pretty much, of a service company if they did work and got revenue. So if a service company did work and got revenue, they would say that they did. if we didn't get cash, we did it on account. We got accounts receivable. Accounts receivable would increase. So accounts receivable is going up by 35 7 which is 420 units times $85. And then the other side would go to revenue. Revenue is a credit balance account. We're going to make it go up by doing the same thing, another credit. So we would credit then revenue. So there's going to be our transaction, debiting accounts receivable, crediting revenue. Note as well that this $85 has nothing to do with our worksheet in terms of the cost. It only has to do with the sales price. We may use the cost to generate to figure out what the sales price will be, but the cost is what we are dealing with mainly in this problem. The sales price is going to be something different uh, from the cost. We're going to have to figure out what the sales price is. That's not what we're tracking in our worksheet. The journal entry we are not doing is this half, meaning inventory is not going down and cost of goods sold is not being recorded. Why? Because we're using a periodic system. Why would we use a periodic system? Possibly because our system is not sophisticated enough in order to do a perpetual system. In other words, I know, we know, even if we have uh, like a clerk working at the uh, front of the store, that uh, what the sales price will be, because it'll be on the sticker price. But we may not know what the cost is, especially if we have multiple types of inventory. 
and therefore it will be easier to make the sales transactions what we're concentrating on when we're trying to generate money if we just record this half of it at the sale and then record this half at the end of the time period if however we had a more sophisticated system such as a scanner that could report this information as it happens real time without us even needing to know about it or deal with it then we could we can use a, a perpetual system which would be better for the accounting purposes um, as we go so we're going to report or record this side now here's accounts receivable here here's accounts receivable up here we would then be increasing accounts receivable with a debit bringing it up to 80,600 then we have the sales 35,007 credit nothing's in sales over here we're going to increase it 35,700 to 35,700 if we see the full accounts then here's where we started here's our journal entries here's where we ended up we can see that of course the accounts receivable went up and revenue went up bringing net income up net income calculated as this revenue 35700 minus these expenses 500 300 900 9920 giving us revenue not a loss revenue these are these accounts right here of 27980 now note this amount is totally off because we do not record at this point cost of goods sold cost of goods sold has not been recorded we only recorded the increase in revenue therefore our net income under a periodic system is very not correct until the end of the period so we just have to recognize that as we go and not make decisions on this number because it's not accurate until we record the cost of goods sold as well as the increase in inventory which also is not correct at this point in time because we obviously gave up some inventory to generate this revenue and have not yet recorded under the periodic system we will record it at the end of the period the end of the month the end of march in this case next transaction we're going to say on 318 we purchased 120 units at 60 dollars per unit so here's where we started off last time we're going to continue right here on march 18th we're going to say there's another purchase so it's going to look like a similar transaction we're going to be in the purchasing side here we're going to say we got 120 units they cost $60. Note the rising prices from 50 to 55 to 60. If we multiply the 120 times the 60, we get the 7,200. We're then going to pull this information over to the ending inventory item to see what is still there now at the end of the time period. We're going to pull down this information, what we already had. So these two columns or rows, we're going to pull those down. That inventory is still there. And then we're going to add to it this inventory item. So now we have three layers of inventory. We've got 100 units at 50. We've got 400 units at 55. We've got 120 units at 60. They're all the same widgets. They're all the same thing. They have, right, they have different prices under a first in, first out. We assume we sell this one first. Note we've already made a sale. And we may have made more than one sale. I just recorded one uh, as an example. But we didn't reduce it yet we will reduce it at the end of the time period when we do the physical count and note that because of that because the layers could be different throughout the time period that means that uh, a perpetual system and a periodic system even after the end of the month after the adjustment has been recorded could differ even using the same flow assumptions such as first in first out so if we use a perpetual system and a periodic system under first in first out it is possible for us and, but not necessarily the case that we end up with a different uh, numbers at the end of uh, the time period even after the recording of the adjustment so then we're going to add these up we're going to say okay the 5,000 plus the 22,000 plus the 7,002 that gives us the 34,200 this is what should be on our financials this is what should be on our, tr our trial balance we're now going to record the purchase again and see that this number which should be what we end up with with inventory Note that these purchases, once again, don't change uh, under any method. First in, first out, last in, first out, uh, average identification, perpetual, periodic. They will be the same as will the journal entry that we will record now. So here's the journal entry. Here's our new transaction that we had here, the 7,200 that we purchased. It is what it is. doesn't change under either method. We're going to say that inventory is what we purchased. It has a debit balance. We're going to make it go up by doing the same thing to it, another debit. So we will debit the inventory. 
The second component will be the way we paid for it, not with cash in this case. We bought it on account. So we have accounts payable as a liability. It's going to go up by doing the same thing to it, another credit. So if we post this out, then we're going to say here's the inventory. Started at 27000 It's going to go up by 7200 to a total of 34200 here we have the accounts payable started at 34,150. It's going to go up by 7,200 to 41,350. If we see all those accounts, then here's what we have. And obviously, inventory went up to 34,200. That's what we have on our worksheet. Our worksheet supporting that number on our trial balance. The accounts payable is is here and no effect on the net income no effect down here even though we bought inventory we didn't expense the inventory at the time of purchase we put it on the books as an asset we will expense it when we consume it to generate revenue in the form of cost of goods sold however we won't record that cost of goods sold under a periodic system till the end of the period the end of the month the end of march in this case next transaction 325 Purchase 200 units at $62 per unit. So note we're only recording the purchases here in this worksheet. And there, we might have more sales happening, but I'm not going to record all the sales because that's not what's going to be recorded in this worksheet. We're going to figure out the cost of goods sold related to the sales at the end of the time period with a physical count. So it's going to be another purchase, another uh, familiar transaction on March 25th. We purchased 200 units, $62. Note the rising prices, 55 to 60 to 62. It started at 50 at the beginning, and that gives us 12,400. We had the layers here before, the 100, the 400, the 120 at 50, 55, and 60. We pulled those down, so they're all under the same date line. So as of March 25th, I only want to be working with stuff that's under this green line. So that's why we have to pull all this down and then we'll pull this over, adding one more row. So now we have 100 units at $50, 400 units at $55, 120 units at $60, and 200 units at $62 for a total of 5,000 plus 22,000 plus 7,200 plus 12,400 or 46,200. This then should be what is on our financial statement after we record this transaction which doesn't change under either method, FIFO, LIFO, average, periodic, perpetual, it is what it is. Here's the journal entry. We're going to record this transaction, this 12,000 that we, 400 that we purchased. It's going to be inventory increasing. Inventory has a debit balance, 34,200. We need to make it go up, doing the same thing to it, debiting it. Then we're going to increase not the cash, but accounts payable. Accounts payable has a credit balance. We do the same thing to it another credit if we post this then we're going to say that this is the inventory 34,200 we will increase it by the 12,004 and then it'll go up to 46,600 matching our worksheet then the accounts payable is here we're going to post that to this 41,350 increasing it by 12,400 to 53,750 the main point here being that the inventory is matching the 46,600 uh, matching and supported by our worksheet here. Next thing we're going to do, we're going to say it's the end of the period now, and we had ending inventory that we will then count. And now this is going to be the key component to the periodic system. What we have not done is record the middle column. We haven't recorded the cost of goods sold. Not showing the cost of goods sold column here to save some space. We only have the purchases and the inventory. We will be working on the cost of goods sold to figure out now what we did sell, how much of the inventory we sold, how. First, we're going to figure out how many units we have left with a physical count. So we'll take a physical count and we say how many units we got left. We've got 240 units. Then we typically look at this in terms of the cost of goods sold calculation. Note that this 240 units is in units and our numbers here are in dollars. So the fact that there's a conversion problem and uh, more complicated by the fact that the costs are, are not all the same, even though we have the same amount or kind of inventory, means that we have to do some type of conversion that's a little bit more complex. We can do this cost of goods sold calculation in terms of both units and dollars. Cost of goods sold calculation must be memorized. <laughs> it's, it's kind of uh, an essential component, and it goes like this. 
we got the beginning inventory where we started at the beginning of the time period. We're going to say purchases. And then typically we have a subcategory, subcategory being uh, goods available for sale. So whatever we had at the beginning plus whatever we purchased through the entire month is what we could have sold during the time period. It does not mean that we had that amount at any point in time during the time period. It means that that's how much went through the, the accounting department or our, our warehouse during that time period and therefore could have been sold at some point through the time, in our case, the month of, of March. Then we're going to subtract from that the ending inventory, the amount we counted, the amount we counted, and that'll give us the cost of goods sold. So this will be the typical uh, calculation. You just got to kind of memorize this. Note that this cost of goods sold or goods available for sale is a subcategory. You could just have beginning inventory plus purchases minus ending inventory and eliminate this subcategory. But you want to know that subcategory's name because it will be named oftentimes in problems and in practice. So we're going to do this first in units and then in dollars. So we're going to say beginning inventory in units was this 100 units. That's what we started with. Purchases, that's why it's nice to have the purchases column set out here, was uh, 400 plus 120 plus 200. We can just add those up, the quantity, the units, giving us 720, meaning that in units we could have sold uh, 820. Now, that, again, doesn't mean we had 820 at any point in time during the time period. We could have been selling throughout this entire time period, but uh, that's how much went through the warehouse through this time period and therefore was available for sale and could have we could have sold at that time. Then we're going to do the physical count, the inventory count, 240. That's what we counted the inventory to be. If this is what we could have sold, if this is what went through the warehouse at any given time, and we only have this in the warehouse now as of the end of the month, then we can subtract the 820 available minus what we currently have and assume we have cost of goods sold of 580. Note there is an assumption there because it assumes that we sold these units as opposed to lost them, had them stolen, broke them, or something like that. And, uh, and that's part of the, the problems with a periodic system in that in a perpetual system, we can have an, an easier calculation to kind of figure out how much might have been done to shrinkage, some kind of loss or theft, as opposed to sales. But our hope is that most of this was sales, and the part that was theft or loss or some other uh, component is not significantly high, and therefore will still record the cost of goods sold as the cost of goods sold. In other words, it would be immaterial to decision making. Now we're going to do the same thing in terms of dollars. The same cost of goods sold calculation beginning inventory was 5000 Then we had purchases, which was this 22 plus the 7 plus the 12 in the purchases side, in the purchases column, giving us 41600 If this is what we had in dollars at the beginning, this is what we purchased. No estimate here. It is what it is. That's what we purchased for. Then we're going to have 46600 Notice that, again, th this item here is going to be the same under any method. It's going to be first in, first out, last in, first out, perpetual period. It purchases what we purchased. So we got the 46,600. Now we've got the ending inventory. That's where the problem is because we know the units, but I can't just convert the units to dollars because we know that the units all cost different amounts. We have to use a cost. That's where the estimate is going to play in. So this is kind of where we have to stop until we go back to the worksheet and say, okay, well, which units did we sell and how much did they cost? And so we're going to do that here. Remember, we had 100 units at $50, 400 units at $55, 120 units at $60, and 200 units at $62. Under a first-in, first-out method, we assume we sold these units first. Now, note uh, what we have here. This is our worksheet. We got the ending inventory and the cost of goods sold column now. This column that we haven't used the entire time period, which we are now using at the end of the time period. You could think of this problem a couple different ways. If you see it in multiple choice questions, they may only ask you for, for example, what is left in ending inventory or what is uh, cost of goods sold. But you really want to be able to set up the problem so you can do both sides and be able to answer both, uh, both questions. That's why a worksheet like this is good to be able to set up. So in other words, there's 240 uh, left here. So we could start at the ending inventory and try to figure out, okay, well, if I sold 
uh, these ones first, then I've got the 200 left, and I could try to figure out how much of the 240 is left. Or we can say if we sold 240, then the unit, I mean, if we have 240 left, then we sold 580. And we could try to figure out and look at the same data and think of it from that side. We could say, okay, if we sold 580, we sold this first and then this second. So that, that's how we're going to do it here. We're going to, we're going to use this 580 number and try to figure out what we then sold and record that in this cost of goods sold side. So in other words, if we sold 580 units, we're using this number, then we sold all of this 100 units at 50. We assume that that is gone. So this whole row has been wiped out here. So this row is basically gone. And then we sold uh, 400 at 55. This row is basically gone. We sold all of those because we're trying to get up to 580. And those are gone. And now we're going to say, okay, how much do we have left here? Well, we got 580 is what we needed, minus 400 and 100, or 500. That means we had 80 units that we must have sold at this layer. So we had 80 units that we sold at $60. And that's going to give us 4,800. 4, so this is going to be the layers we had. Of the 580 units, 580 units, we sold 50, 100 of them at $50, 400 at 55, 80 at 60. That's the assumption we have. And that's going to be our calculation. If we add those up, well, let's first see what we have left now. Then if we see what we have left, th these, remember, we wiped these out. So those are gone. So this, this row is now gone. This row is now gone because 400 minus 400. So here's the 400 minus the 400 is zero. The 100 minus the 100 is zero. And then the 120 and uh, minus the 80 is going to say that we have 40 units left there. And that's going to be that. And then the 200, of course, is just has not been touched. We have the 200 left. So what we have left then from these layers is these layers down here, uh, 40 units at $60, 200 units at 62, giving us 2,400 plus the 12,400 or 14,800. So we really need to be able to look at this from two perspectives, what we sold, what the cost of goods sold is, and what we have left. Now we have the, the ability to complete this. We can say the, the, uh, the ending inventory is going to be that 14,800. And then the 46,600 minus that 14,800 will be the cost of goods sold, 31,800 or 5,000 plus 22 plus 4,008 would give us that 31,800. If we go and we, count and we make the journal entry now, the final journal entry that we have not been making this entire time period, this is the journal entry we would be seeing every time we make a sale under a perpetual system, the one we have not been seeing, Every time we make a sale under a periodic system, we haven't even shown it uh, all the time, just one time just to show uh, the difference, will be this. So this is the second half. Remember, when we make a sale, typically under a perpetual system, we break that journal entry into two components to think about it theoretically. One is the sales side and the accounts receivable side, increasing accounts receivable, increasing revenue. That's what we have seen. What we have not seen, what we did not do, is the other side, every time we make a sale, decreasing the inventory for what we sold, and increasing the cost of goods sold. That's what we're going to do now for the entire time period for all sales that happen through the time period through the month through March. So we're going to say cost of goods sold is going to increase by cost of goods sold, the 31800 and the inventory then, it being a debit balance, is going to go down by all the inventory we gave up throughout the month, 31800 Once we post this then, this inventory will be left with what we calculated ending inventory to be 14,800. So let's post this. We're going to post the 31,800 cost of goods sold at zero increases 31,800 to 31,800. We'll post the inventory then. So the inventory started at 46,600 increasing or sorry decreasing with a credit of 31,800 to 14,800. That then of course matching are 14,800 here. And that's going to be the key component here. 
If we see all the accounts put together, we see the 14,800, our ending balance matches what we calculated here. We see now that our net income is affected dramatically. It's going down. It's the net income is this 15,900 revenue minus all the expenses. This expense, cost of goods sold, huge expense, has just increased, bringing net income way down from 40,000 net income down by 31.8 to this 8,380. This is still income. It's not a loss. But until we record this huge component, this huge expense, cost of goods sold, big number, then under a periodic system, our net income is drastically wrong until that adjustment happens at the end of the time period. So we just need to recognize that, of course. If we see our calculations, then we know that the cost of goods sold calculation, we can tie it out to the worksheet and tie it out to our numbers on the trial balance. This is going to be the ending. This is our ending trial balance now. So we've got... The uh, cost of goods sold is here, would match the 5,000 plus the 22 plus the 4,008, same number here, and of course it's the same number on our trial balance. We can see that the ending inventory is 14,800 here, also 14,800 on our worksheet, and 14,800 on the trial balance. In this presentation, we will discuss First In, First Out, or FIFO, using a periodic system as compared to a perpetual system. As we go through this, we want to keep that in mind all the time, that being that we are using First In, First Out as opposed to some other systems, Last In, First Out, for example, or Average Cost, and we're doing so using a periodic system rather than a perpetual system. Best way to demonstrate is with example, so we'll go through an example problem. We're going to be using this worksheet for our example problem. It looks like an extended worksheet or a large worksheet, but it really is the best worksheet to go through in order to figure out all the components of problems that deal with these cost flow assumptions, including a first in, first out, last in, first out, or an average method and using a periodic or perpetual for any of them. If we could set up the worksheet that would look something like this, then we can set up the same type of format for any of those types of problems. And you can see if you mix and match the fact that we can have a perpetual or periodic system for those three methods, FIFO, LIFO, and AVERAGE, there's actually a, a lot of problems that could be asked that are slightly different in terms of methods with regard to inventory cost flow assumptions. So the format of the worksheet, it's going to be three columns or three separate sections, purchases, cost of merchandise sold, and inventory. When considering the periodic system as, proposed, as opposed to the perpetual system, we don't really need this middle section until the end, until we finally do the final calculation, which is where most problems will probably be focused because that's where the adjustment will happen. Until that happens throughout the time period, we're just going to be recording the purchases, and then we're going to record the what is still there, including what was there before, plus the purchases to see what would be in ending inventory. In each of these sections, we have at least three components, and those components will be the quantity, the unit cost, and the total cost. And we'll have to do a conversion each time because clearly inventory is some type of unit, some types of quantity, that we will then have to apply some type of dollar to in order to get them on the financial statements. In other words, we cannot put quantity on the financial statements. We have to put dollars on the financial statements and therefore convert the quantity of the inventory we have to dollars in some way. We'll have the same thing for the cost of merchandise sold. Once again, this column not being used so much, so frequently as in a perpetual system in the system we will be using, a periodic system. And then we've got the ending inventory, which will have, once again, the quantity, the unit, and the total cost. If we have this set up, then uh, this will be workable for any kind of inventory flow a problem generally. And we can put the information into this system and figure out not just the cost of goods sold or not just the ending inventory, but both components of them. So going through this problem, we're going to say that we have the beginning inventory first. So this is going to just be the given of most problems. This is where we start. This is where we were at at the beginning of the month or the end of last month. And that's where we will start our worksheet. So we had 100 uh, units. We're just going to put them in the ending inventory. They're not being purchased at this time. They were purchased sometime before this month, sometime before March. And then we're going to have the unit cost. We're going to say the first inventory we had cost $50. And 
And if we multiply 100 times the 50, we get the 5,000. The 5,000 then is what would be on the uh, income statement, I mean on the balance sheet or the trial balance. And this is the amount that will be on the financial statements. I'm going to repeat that over here and pull it out to the left side because later on we will have multiple rows and we'll want to sum up to see what will actually be uh, the total that will be reported on the financials. So here's our beginning balance. If we were to compare that to the financials or in our case the trial balance in order assets, liabilities, equity, income, and expenses, the zero representing that we are in balance, the debits being in positive numbers, the credits being bracketed, and therefore debits minus the credits equals that zero. Net income net here is a loss at this point where we have no revenue, just expenses, the 500, the 300, the 9,920 being that 10,000 and 720. We, of course, are concentrating here on the inventory which now matches our worksheet. So you can see that this worksheet, this is just the last column of the worksheet, is tying out to what we have on the trial balance. That will be consistently what will happen. And you can compare this to, if we had the accounts receivable here, for example, it has a supporting a ledger. All of these accounts have supporting ledgers, including inventory of the general ledger by date. But remember that an account like Accounts Receivable wants a supporting ledger not by date, but also by customer. Who do we, uh, who owes us money? And inventory is going to be a similar way. We want to see supporting data not just by date, but by inventory item. What, what, how many units do we have and what's the cost of those units? Now we're going to go to the next thing that happens, which is going to say we purchased on 35, 400 units at 55. Notice that the last units we purchased were at 50. We have rising prices. That's the problem. And that's the problem because prices don't stay the same even though we're buying the same units. These are the same widgets, whatever we're selling. The inventory we're imagining here, all the same. But the price is going up due to, if nothing else, inflation. Now it is possible for prices to go down, but you want to really think of going up as the norm and then going down being pretty much the opposite when we think of the effect on the financial statements if we know what is happening, if we know the difference in the comparison as prices increase, we can easily just reverse them for the condition where prices decrease. So we're going to say then on our worksheet on March 5th, it's going to be the next item here, we will say that we have 400 units. It's going to start off in the purchases here. We're going to list the purchases separate so we can see all the purchases in its own section. Then we're going to add the purchases over here to the ending inventory to what we already have in the beginning and get to our ending inventory number. So we got 400 units in the purchases. They cost $55. 400 times 55 is the 22,000. Now we're going to pull that information over here to the ending inventory. In order to do so, we will first bring down this number. This is going to be our first layer. We want to have it in the same date range because that'll just make things easier to look through. So we're just going to pull that whole thing down. We just copied this whole thing down here just so it's all under the same date range. We're not copying the 5,000 because that's going to sum up the full layers for any date range. Here for March 1st, here for March 5th, it's not going to just be that. It's going to be that plus this 22, which we will now put in the ending inventory as well. So we're going to move that over and copy it over here. So there is some repetition here, of course. We have to copy this over and copy this over, but by so doing that, we can have everything on this date line and we can show the purchases in a separate column so that we can clearly see the purchases column and the cost of goods sold column. Then we're just going to add up these, these two outer numbers under this date line. So remember, we only care now about everything under this green line. That's all that matters at this point in time. We got the 5,000 plus the 22,000 means we've got 27,000. So we have two layers of inventory now under first in first out we've got the 100 units at 50 we've got the 400 units at 55 under first in first out we would assume that we sell the 100 units first although remember that's just an assumption the the people purchasing could purchase any unit they want because possibly we haven't even uh, labeled them uh, uh, to be able to distinguish which is which we're just assuming that the the first units we're going to sell first then if we did the journal entry behind this, we would say, okay, now we're going to record the journal entry for this purchase here that we made, this purchase here. 
and see what happens in terms of transactions. It's important to tie this worksheet out to the financial statements here. So we're going to say, okay, here's the inventory. It has a debit balance of 5,000. We bought 22,000 more of inventory. Note this is not an estimate. This is going to be the same whether we use FIFO, LIFO, average, specific identification, perpetual, periodic system, under any of those methods. Always the same, not an estimate. It went up for whatever it's going to go up for. We're going to pay 22000 Because it has a debit, we'll do the same thing to it, another debit. So we'll debit inventory. We're going to assume we didn't pay cash but purchased it on account, and therefore cash will not be decreasing. The good thing's not going down. The bad thing's going up. We owe accounts payable. So accounts payable has a credit balance. We're going to make it go up doing the same thing to it, another credit. So if we post this, and if we post this to our worksheet, we have the 5,000 plus the 22,000 giving us 27,000. Then we post this accounts payable to our worksheet. We've got the 12,150 plus the 22,000, meaning we owe now 34,150. So if we were to see that all together, then here's all the numbers filled out. This is our beginning balance worksheet. Here's our adjustment that we made. Here's where we end up. Here's the ending balance after that adjustment. We can see that the 27,000 here matches what is on our worksheet. So it supports, the worksheet supports what is on the financial statements, what is on our trial balance. Note there's no effect on net income, even though we purchased inventory. We're not going to expense inventory at the point of purchase. We will expense it when we consume it in order to help us generate revenue in the form of cost of goods sold. However, we won't make that adjustment under a periodic system until the end of the period, the end of the month, the end of March in this case. Next item, we're going to say that there was a sale of 420 units at $85. Now note what we're not showing here here. We're not showing the worksheet for the cost worksheet because under a periodic system, we only record the, the sales component of it. We're not going to record the related cost component until the end of the period, until we do a physical count. This is really the difference between the two methods in terms of the transactions as we go through the period. So in terms of a periodic system, we will record the journal entry, but nothing will be recorded to the inventory accounts. Nothing will be reported to the new accounts when we go from a service company to a merchandising company, those accounts of inventory and cost of goods sold. What we will record is the first half of the transaction that we typically think of when we make a sale of inventory. The transaction that would be the same in, in many respects, in all respects pretty much, of a service company if they did work and got revenue. So if a service company did work and got revenue, they would say that they did. if we didn't get cash, we did it on account. We got accounts receivable. Accounts receivable would increase. So accounts receivable is going up by 35.7 which is 420 units times $85. And then the other side would go to revenue. Revenue is a credit balance account. We're going to make it go up by doing the same thing, another credit. So we would credit then revenue. So there's going to be our transaction, debiting accounts receivable, crediting revenue. Note as well that this $85 has nothing to do with our worksheet in terms of the cost. It only has to do with the sales price. We may use the cost to generate to figure out what the sales price will be, but the cost is what we are dealing with mainly in this problem. The sales price is going to be something different uh, from the cost. We're going to have to figure out what the sales price is. That's not what we're tracking in our worksheet. The journal entry we are not doing is this half, meaning inventory is not going down and cost of goods sold is not being recorded. Why? Because we're using a periodic system. Why would we use a periodic system? Possibly because our system is not sophisticated enough in order to do a perpetual system. In other words, I know, we know, even if we have uh, like a clerk working at the uh, front of the store, that uh, what the sales price will be, because it'll be on the sticker price. But we may not know what the cost is, especially if we have multiple types of inventory. And therefore, it will be easier to make the sales transactions, what we're concentrating on when we're trying to generate money, if we just record this half of it at the sale and then record this half at the end of the time period. If, however, we had a more sophisticated system, such as a scanner, that could report this information as it happens real time without us even needing to know about it or deal with it, 
then we could we can use a, a perpetual system which would be better for the accounting purposes um, as we go so we're going to report or record this side now here's accounts receivable here here's accounts receivable up here we would then be increasing accounts receivable with a debit bringing it up to 80,600 then we have the sales 35,007 credit nothing's in sales over here we're going to increase it 35,700 to 35,700 if we see the full accounts then here's where we started here's our journal entries here's where we ended up we can see that of course the accounts receivable went up and revenue went up bringing net income up net income calculated as this revenue 35700 minus these expenses 500 300 900 9920 giving us revenue not a loss revenue these are these accounts right here of 27980 now note this amount is totally off because we do not record at this point cost of goods sold cost of goods sold has not been recorded we only recorded the increase in revenue therefore our net income under a periodic system is very not correct until the end of the period so we just have to recognize that as we go and not make decisions on this number because it's not accurate until we record the cost of goods sold as well as the increase in inventory which also is not correct at this point in time because we obviously gave up some inventory to generate this revenue and have not yet recorded under the periodic system we will record it at the end of the period the end of the month the end of march in this case next transaction we're going to say on 318 we purchased 120 units at 60 dollars per unit so here's where we started off last time we're going to continue right here on march 18th we're going to say there's another purchase so it's going to look like a similar transaction we're going to be in the purchasing side here we're going to say we got 120 units they cost sixty dollars note the rising prices from 50 to 55 to 60. if we multiply the 120 times the 60 we get the 7200. we're then going to pull this information over to the ending inventory item to see what is still there now at the end of the time period we're going to pull down this information what we already had so these two columns or rows we're going to pull those down that inventory is still there and then we're going to add to it this inventory item so now we have three layers of inventory we've got 100 units at 50 we got 400 units at 55 we got 120 units at 60 they're all the same widgets they're all the same thing they have right they have different prices under a first in first out we assume we sell this one first note we've already made a sale and we may have made more than one sale i just recorded one uh, as an example but we didn't reduce it yet we will reduce it at the end of the time period when we do the physical count and note that because of that because the layers could be different throughout the time period that means that uh, a perpetual system and a periodic system even after the end of the month after the adjustment has been recorded could differ even using the same flow assumptions such as first in first out so if we use a perpetual system and a periodic system under first in first out it is possible for us and but not necessarily the case that we end up with a different uh, numbers at the end of uh, the time period even after the recording of the adjustment so then we're going to add these up we're going to say okay the 5,000 plus the 22,000 plus the 7,002 that gives us the 34,200 this is what should be on our financials this is what should be on our, tr our trial balance we're now going to record the purchase again and see that this number which should be what we end up with with inventory note that these purchases once again don't change uh, under any method first in first out last in first out uh, average identification perpetual periodic they will be the same as will the journal entry that we will record now so here's the journal entry here's our new transaction that we had here the 7200 that we purchased it is what it is doesn't change under either method we're going to say that inventory is what we purchased it has a debit balance we're going to make it go up by doing the same thing to it another debit so we will debit the inventory the second component will be the way we paid for it not with cash in this case we bought it on account so we have accounts payable as a liability it's going to go up by doing the same thing to it another credit so if we post this out then we're going to say here's the inventory started at 27,000 it's going to go up by 7,200 to a total of 34,200 
Here we have the accounts payable started at 34,150. It's going to go up by 7,200 to 41,350. If we see all those accounts, then here's what we have. And obviously, inventory went up to 34,200. That's what we have on our worksheet. Our worksheet supporting that number on our trial balance. The accounts payable is, is here and no effect on the net income. No effect down here, even though we bought inventory. We didn't expense the inventory at the time of purchase. We put it on the books as an asset. We will expense it when we consume it to generate revenue in the form of cost of goods sold. However, we won't record that cost of goods sold under a periodic system till the end of the period, the end of the month, the end of March in this case. Next transaction, 325, purchase 200 units at $62 per unit. So note we're only recording the purchases here in this worksheet. And then we might have more sales happening, but I'm not going to record all the sales because that's not what's going to be recorded in this worksheet. We're going to figure out the cost of goods sold related to the sales at the end of the time period with a physical count. So it's going to be another purchase, another uh, familiar transaction on March 25th. We purchased 200 units, $62. Note the rising prices, 55 to 60 to 62. It started at 50 at the beginning, and that gives us 12,400. We had the layers here before, the 100, the 400, the 120 at 50, 55, and 60. We pulled those down, so they're all under the same date line. So as of March 25th, I only want to be working with stuff that's under this green line. So that's why we have to pull all this down and then we'll pull this over, adding one more row. So now we have 100 units at $50, 400 units at $55, 120 units at $60, and 200 units at $62 for a total of 5,000 plus 22,000 plus 7,200 plus 12,400 or 46,200. This then should be what is on our financial statement after we record this transaction which doesn't change under either method FIFO LIFO average periodic perpetual it is what it is here's the journal entry we're going to record this transaction this 12,000 that we 400 that we purchased it's going to be inventory increasing inventory has a debit balance 34,200 we need to make it go up doing the same thing to it debiting it then we're going to increase not the cash but accounts payable Accounts payable as a credit balance. We do the same thing to it. Another credit. If we post this then, we're going to say that this is the inventory, 34200 We will increase it by the 12004 And then it'll go up to 46600 matching our worksheet. Then the accounts payable is here. We're going to post that to this 41350 increasing it by 12400 to 53750 the main point here being that the inventory is matching the 46,600 uh, matching and supported by our worksheet here. Next thing we're going to do, we're going to say it's the end of the period now and we had ending inventory that we will then count. And now this is going to be the key component to the periodic system. What we have not done is record the middle column. We haven't recorded the cost of goods sold. Not showing the cost of goods sold column here to save some space. We only have the purchases and the inventory. We will be working on the cost of goods sold to figure out now what we did sell, how much of the inventory we sold, how. First, we're going to figure out how many units we have left with a physical count. So we'll take a physical count and we say how many units we got left. We've got 240 units. Then we typically look at this in terms of the cost of goods sold calculation. Note that this 240 units is in units and our numbers here are in dollars. So the fact that there's a conversion problem and uh, more complicated by the fact that the costs are, are not all the same, even though we have the same amount or kind of inventory, means that we have to do some type of conversion that's a little bit more complex. We can do this cost of goods sold calculation in terms of both units and dollars. Cost of goods sold calculation must be memorized. <laughs> it's, it's kind of uh, an essential component, and it goes like this. We got the beginning inventory where we started at the beginning of the time period. We're going to say purchases, and then typically we have a subcategory, subcategory being uh, goods available for sale. So whatever we had at the beginning, plus whatever we purchased through the entire month, is what we could have sold during the time period. 
it does not mean that we had that amount at any point in time during the time period. It means that that's how much went through the, the accounting department or our, our warehouse during that time period and therefore could have been sold at some point through the time, in our case, the month of, of March. Then we're going to subtract from that the ending inventory, the amount we counted, the amount we counted, and that'll give us the cost of goods sold. So this will be the typical uh, calculation. You just got to kind of memorize this. Note that this cost of goods sold or goods available for sale is a subcategory. You could just have beginning inventory plus purchases minus ending inventory and eliminate this subcategory. But you want to know that subcategory's name because it will be named oftentimes in problems and in practice. So we're going to do this first in units and then in dollars. So we're going to say beginning inventory in units was this 100 units. That's what we started with. Purchases, that's why it's nice to have the purchases column set out here, was uh, 400 plus 120 plus 200. We can just add those up, the quantity, the units, giving us 720, meaning that in units we could have sold uh, 820. Now, that, again, doesn't mean we had 820 at any point in time during the time period. We could have been selling throughout this entire time period, but uh, that's how much went through the warehouse through this time period and therefore was available for sale and could have we could have sold at that time. Then we're going to do the physical count, the inventory count, 240. That's what we counted the inventory to be. If this is what we could have sold, if this is what went through the warehouse at any given time, and we only have this in the warehouse now as of the end of the month, then we can subtract the 820 available minus what we currently have and assume we have cost of goods sold of 580. Note there is an assumption there because it assumes that we sold these units as opposed to lost them, had them stolen, broke them, or something like that. And, uh, and that's part of the, the problems with a periodic system in that in a perpetual system, we can have an, an easier calculation to kind of figure out how much might have been done to shrinkage, some kind of loss or theft, as opposed to sales. But our hope is that most of this was sales, and the part that was theft or loss or some other uh, component is not significantly high, and therefore will still record the cost of goods sold as the cost of goods sold. In other words, it would be immaterial to decision making. Now we're going to do the same thing in terms of dollars. The same cost of goods sold calculation beginning inventory was 5000 Then we had purchases, which was this 22 plus the 7 plus the 12 in the purchases side, in the purchases column, giving us 41600 If this is what we had in dollars at the beginning, this is what we purchased. No estimate here. It is what it is. That's what we purchased for. Then we're going to have 46600 Notice that, again, th this item here is going to be the same under any method. It's going to be first in, first out, last in, first out, perpetual period. It purchases what we purchased. So we got the 46,600. Now we've got the ending inventory. That's where the problem is because we know the units, but I can't just convert the units to dollars because we know that the units all cost different amounts. We have to use a cost. That's where the estimate is going to play in. So this is kind of where we have to stop until we go back to the worksheet and say, okay, well, which units did we sell and how much did they cost? And so we're going to do that here. Remember we had 100 units at $50, 400 units at $55, 120 units at $60, and 200 units at $62. Under a first-in, first-out method, we assume we sold these units first. Now note uh, what we have here. This is our worksheet. We got the ending inventory and the cost of goods sold column now. This column that we haven't used the entire time period, which we are now using at the end of the time period. You could think of this problem a couple different ways. If you see it in multiple choice questions, they may only ask you for, for example, what is left in ending inventory or what is uh, cost of goods sold. But you really want to be able to set up the problem so you can do both sides and be able to answer both, uh, both questions. That's why a worksheet like this is good to be able to set up. So in other words, there's 240 uh, left here. So we could start at the ending inventory and try to figure out, okay, well, if I sold uh, these ones first, then I've got the 200 left and I could try to figure out how much of the 240 is left. Or we can say if we sold 240, then the unit, I mean, if we have 240 left, then we sold 580. And we could try to figure out and look at the same data and think of it from that side. We can say, okay, if we sold 580, we sold this first, 
and then this second. So that, that's how we're going to do it here. We're going to, we're going to use this 580 number and try to figure out what we then sold and record that in this cost of goods sold side. So in other words, if we sold 580 units, we're using this number, then we sold all of this 100 units at 50. We assume that that is gone. So this whole row has been wiped out here. So this row is basically gone. And then we sold uh, 400 at 55. This row is basically gone. We sold all of those because we're trying to get up to 580. And those are gone. And now we're going to say, okay, how much do we have left here? Well, we got 580 is what we needed, minus 400 and 100, or 500. That means we had 80 units that we must have sold at this layer. So we had 80 units that we sold at $60. And that's going to give us 4,800. 4, so this is going to be the layers we had. Of the 580 units, 580 units, we sold 50, 100 of them at $50, 400 at 55 80 at 60 That's the assumption we have, and that's going to be our calculation. If we add those up, well, let's first see what we have left now. Then if we see what we have left, th these, remember, we wiped these out, so those are gone. So this, this row is now gone. This row is now gone because 400 minus 400, so here's the 400 minus the 400 is 0. The 100 minus the 100 is 0. And then the 120 and uh, minus the 80 is going to say that we have 40 units left there. And that's going to be that. And then the 200, of course, is just has not been touched. We have the 200 left. So what we have left then from these layers is these layers down here, uh, 40 units at $60, 200 units at 62, giving us 2,400 plus the 12,400 or 14,800. So we really need to be able to look at this from two perspectives, what we sold, what the cost of goods sold is, and what we have left. Now we have the, the ability to complete this. We can say the, the, uh, the ending inventory is going to be that 14,800. And then the 46,600 minus that 14,800 will be the cost of goods sold, 31,800 or 5,000 plus 22 plus 4,008 would give us that 31,800. If we go and we, count and we make the journal entry now, the final journal entry that we have not been making this entire time period, this is the journal entry we would be seeing every time we make a sale under a perpetual system, the one we have not been seeing, Every time we make a sale under a periodic system, we haven't even shown it uh, all the time, just one time just to show uh, the difference, will be this. So this is the second half. Remember, when we make a sale, typically under a perpetual system, we break that journal entry into two components to think about it theoretically. One is the sales side and the accounts receivable side, increasing accounts receivable, increasing revenue. That's what we have seen. What we have not seen, what we did not do, is the other side, every time we make a sale, decreasing the inventory for what we sold, and increasing the cost of goods sold. That's what we're going to do now for the entire time period for all sales that happen through the time period through the month through March. So we're going to say cost of goods sold is going to increase by cost of goods sold, the 31800 and the inventory then, it being a debit balance, is going to go down by all the inventory we gave up throughout the month, 31800 Once we post this then, this inventory will be left with what we calculated ending inventory to be 14,800. So let's post this. We're going to post the 31,800 cost of goods sold at zero, increases 31,800 to 31,800. We'll post the inventory then. So the inventory started at 46,600, increasing, or sorry, decreasing with a credit of 31,800 to 14,800. That then, of course, matching are 14,800 here. And that's going to be the key component here. If we see all the accounts put together, we see the 14,800, our ending balance matches what we calculated here. We see now that our net income is affected dramatically. It's going down. It's The net income is this 15,900 revenue minus all the expenses. This expense, cost of goods sold, huge expense, has just increased, bringing net income way down from 40,000 net income down by 31.8 to 
to this 8,380. This is still income, it's not a loss, but until we record this huge component, this huge expense, cost of goods sold, big number, then under a periodic system, our net income is drastically wrong until that adjustment happens at the end of the time period. So we just need to recognize that, of course. If we see our calculations then, we know that the cost of goods sold calculation, we can tie it out to the worksheet and tie it out to our numbers on the trial balance. It's going to be the ending. This is our ending trial balance now. So we've got the uh, cost of goods sold is here, would match the 5,000 plus the 22 plus the 4,008. Same number here, and of course it's the same number on our trial balance. We can see that the ending inventory is 14,800 here, also 14,800 on our worksheet, and 14,800 on the trial balance. In this presentation, we will discuss the last in, first out inventory system on a periodic basis rather than a perpetual basis. As we go through this process, we want to always be comparing those two. One, the LIFO or last in, first out system to other systems such as first in, first out and average, as well as comparing the perpetual system to the periodic system. We're going to go through this by looking at a problem, the problem going into a worksheet such as this. I do recommend learning this worksheet. This worksheet should look repetitive if you've seen the first in, first out presentation as well as presentations for the perpetual system. That's because this worksheet can be used in order to work most of the flow assumption problems. And there's a lot of them if you think about the combinations we can have including the last in first out method we will be working here or the first in first out method and the average method both those can be done either on a perpetual or periodic system so there's a lot of combinations we could have but they could all fit into this type of worksheet note that problems could ask a comprehensive worksheet such as this or problems could ask for small components if we learn the entire worksheet however we can fit that problem or that worksheet too all the problems related to this type of system inventory flow assumptions that format would be three sections that would be purchases and then the cost of merchandise sold and then the ending inventory within those sections we're going to have the quantity the units and the total for each and that will be able to allow us to separate the purchases from the cost of goods sold and the ending inventory when we're working in a periodic system as we are now we won't be working with this middle column until the very end when we make the adjustment at the end of the time period recording that cost of goods sold and the related decrease in inventory. So the beginning transaction will be the beginning inventory. So we're going to say that we start off at the beginning of the month, in this case March. By the way, as well, note that these formats for the periodic system will look very similar for the systems, including first in, first out, and the last in first out until we get to the end of the problem but we do want to go through this and just put together this worksheet so that we can see how it is formatted and compare and contrast these journal entries as we enter them so we're going to put in the beginning balance 100 units and they're at 50 dollars 100 times 50 is 5000 so that's where we start that's the beginning balance that we are starting with at the beginning of march Note the conversion we have to do here, one from units to the dollar amount to get the $5,000 that will be reported on the financial statements. We're going to pull that $5,000 over to the right because later on we'll have multiple layers and it'll be easier to see if we pull this out to the right, this being the amount we would see on the financial statements. We have the trial balance here. Here's going to be our trial balance. It's in order, assets, liabilities, equity, income, and expenses. We know we're in balance because the debit balances are represented without brackets or positive numbers, credits with brackets or negative numbers, and if we were to add all of them up, they add up to zero. Net income currently is a loss. There's no revenue, and we have these expenses, 500, 300, 9,000, 920 for a loss of 10,720. This is our ending inventory, that the last component that we just pulled over from the worksheet. 5,000 is what is in inventory. That matches what is on our financial statements or trial balance here. That's our starting point. It's important to remember that this worksheet is, in essence, backing up, supporting, being the, the detail behind this inventory information on the trial balance or balance sheet. 
If we go through the next transaction, we're going to say that there's a purchase of 400 units at $55. Notice that the price is rising. They were $50, now they're $55. That's going to be the normal scenario. So the normal process, our price is rising. We want to consider factors as prices go up and then kind of reverse what would happen if there was a decline in price. So we're going to say on March 5th, we bought 400 units, which will clearly go in the purchases section and they cost $55 to give us a total of $22,000. Note that this would be the same under FIFO and LIFO average. It would be the same under a perpetual or periodic in either system. This is not an estimate or assumption. We're then going to pull that over to the ending inventory and add it to what we already have. We want to have everything, however, under this line at this date line so that we don't start getting confused as the worksheet grows. Therefore, we're first going to pull this down so we're just going to say this is the same information we just pulled down here. And now we have 100 units at $50. And then we're just going to pull this over to have the 400 units at 55. So we have a total of 500 units. 100 of them cost us $50. 400 of them cost us $55. If we were to sell something at this point in time and record it, we would assume under last in first out, we sold the last ones we purchased, these 400 first. However, we won't do that until the end of the problem when we count it under the periodic inventory system. We're then going to add these up, the 5,000 and the 22,000, giving us the 27,000. That then will be the amount on the balance sheet or the trial balance. If we then record this, we're recording this purchase, this 22,000. Remember, it doesn't change under whatever inventory method we use. We're going to say that we bought inventory. Inventory has a debit balance. We got more of it, so we're going to do the same thing to it, another debit. We'll debit the inventory, and then we will credit something, not cash. Cash isn't going down. We're crediting instead accounts payable. The liability has a credit balance. We're increasing it by doing the same thing to it, another credit. So there's going to be our transaction. If we post this, then this inventory at 22 will be posted here, the 5,000 going up by the 22,000 to 27,000. This 22000 for the accounts payable will be posted here to accounts payable. The 12150 will go up by 22000 to 34150 That's going to be our transaction. Note that this 27000 now matches what is on our inventory worksheet. If we look at the totals here, we see that they're back in balance, of course. We're back in balance. Debits equaling the credits. And there is no effect on net income, meaning nothing happened in the revenue or expense accounts. All we did was purchase inventory. Inventory is not an expense when we purchase it. It's an asset when we purchase it. It will be expensed, however, but not until we use it in order to help generate revenue, not until it's expensed in the form of cost of goods sold. Next transaction, 3-9, sale of 420 units at $85. This is the only sales transaction we're going to show here because under the periodic system, we would not be recording this to the worksheet. We're only going to be recording the sales half, which is not located on our worksheet. We, we will post the journal entry just to show the journal entry. If it were a perpetual system, then we would be recording the second component and we would be recording it to our worksheet. We would be decreasing, in other words, inventory at the point in time of sale and recording the related cost of goods sold. However, here we will not. So if we think about a sales journal entry, we, we typically, under a perpetual system, which we are not using here, think of it as two types of journal entries, or we can think of it that way, and it's really helpful too when learning uh, these two journal entries uh, or the sales transaction of inventory. One related to the same type of thing happening if we were a service company, eliminating inventory and related accounts, and the other having to do with inventory, recording the decrease in inventory. If we think about the first half of the transaction, the half that we could eliminate inventory accounts be very similar to if we were a service company. We'd say we made a sale on account. We didn't get cash. We got something else. We got an IOU, accounts receivable. It has a debit balance of 40, well, it has a debit balance. We need to make it go up because people owe us more money. We do the same thing to it, another debit. And then the other side of it will go to revenue, whatever that revenue is called. Service company might be fees earned. It might be income, revenue, uh, or sales, depending on the type of company. 
it's all the same thing in terms of the type of account revenue revenue has a credit balance we increase it with a credit so this will be the same under a periodic or perpetual system also note that we have the 420 times 85 to bring us to that amount what will not be the same is we won't have the second transaction here under the periodic system we won't record the cost of goods sold the expense related to this transaction or the inventory now you might ask why why wouldn't we do that uh, it seems reasonable to do that we clearly had given up inventory and it should be going down but uh, it's usually with regard to the sophistication of our system if our system is not an electronic system we want to focus more on the sales process so especially if we have something like a clerk or something making the sales they may know the sales price but they may not know what the cost is and note the cost will be different the cost will not be this 85 dollars it'll be what we paid for the inventory what we're tracking on the worksheet and if we don't have a sophisticated system we might not know that at the point in time of sale or want to have to deal with that at the point in time of sale we will deal with it periodically as we count the inventory at the end of the time period uh, also note that this 35,700 dealing with this 85 times 420 uh, once again this 85 is not something that we're going to see in our worksheet at all it might have something to do with the cost we might have used the cost to derive the sales price but it has nothing to do with our cost worksheet if we were to post this out then we're going to say accounts receivables here accounts receivables there in this journal entry it's going from 44,900 up by 35,700 to 80,600 then we're going to post the income the revenue or the income the sales going from zero up by 35,700 to 35,700 here's all the accounts if we note the effect here we see that net income is going up substantially by the income here it was at a loss we have this revenue this is not a loss this is revenue over expenses 35,000 minus the 500 minus the 300 minus the 9,920 giving us revenue note that this net income number is substantially wrong <laughs> because we haven't recorded the cost of goods sold under the periodic system it will be right at the end of the month when we do the calculation of the physical count of in ending inventory recording the decrease in inventory and the related cost of goods sold this 27,000 also wrong until we get to the end of the month count the inventory make the adjustment so we're still at this 27,000 on the worksheet next transaction we made another purchase 120 units $60 note the rising prices 50 to 55 to 60 that's the norm you want to think about that as normal and then if they reverse that if you see the prices going down you'll just have to reverse some of the assumptions we make or some of the outcomes that will happen so we're going to say on March 18th we have 120 units it's in the purchases section of course and we are saying they're $60 each if we multiply 120 times 60 we get 7,200 once again we want to take this information and put it below this line and have everything below this line to do that we're going to say everything at this date line below this line is what we had before 100 units at 50 400 units at 55 we're just going to bring those down to our new section here and then we're going to bring these items over so now we're going to add the new rows so that's what we have now we have 100 units at 50 we got 400 units at 55 we got 120 units at 60. if we were then to add these up we would say that we have total inventory of 34,200 in terms of dollars we're going to then record this purchase and remember this purchase doesn't change whether using fifo lifo average perpetual or periodic if we then do the recording we're going to say that we got this 7,200 purchase inventory is at 27,000 we need to make it go up we'll do the same thing to it a debit debiting inventory the other side not to go into cash we're going to assume we didn't pay cash but bought on account therefore the accounts payable credit will go up in the credit direction 7,200 then we're going to post this out so here's the inventory here here's our inventory there it's starting at 27,000 going up by 7,200 to a total of 34,200 then we have the accounts payable here it's going to go to the accounts payable there starting at 34,150 going up in the credit direction 7,200 to 41,350 
this ending inventory, that's where we're focused because that matches what we're tracking, the support of that number, that being the inventory worksheet. We look at all the numbers, here's what we have. We note that there's no effect on net income. Net income isn't affected because no income, revenue, or expense accounts are affected. We will expense the inventory, but not at the time of purchase, at the time we sell the inventory in order to generate revenue. We won't do that on a periodic system until we count the inventory at the end of the period, in this case, the end of the month, the month of February. Next transaction, another purchase. So we purchased 200 units at 62. Note we're not recording all the sales here because the sales aren't affecting this worksheet. And this is one thing we have to note when we work through these worksheets. We have to note that we're zooming in on a particular thing and still have an idea of how it fits into the overall picture here. So the 200 is going here. And note if we were in a perpetual system, we would be recording the cost of goods sold here as we go. So now we're going to say on March 25th, we had 200 units. $62. Note the rising prices, 50 to 55 to 60 to 62. 200 times 62 gives us 12,400. Now we're going to bring everything uh, below this line here. We want everything below this line on the ending inventory. It's a very jagged line. It's more like some crazy curve. But here's what we had before. 100 units at 50, 400 units at 55, 120 at 60. We still have those. Or we may not physically have those, but they're still recorded on our, our inventory sheet. We did make sales and have sold some of those, but we haven't known which one yet. We'll do that at the end of the process. So we're really calculating uh, goods available for sale here. So here we have those here. Now we're going to add the new layer. There's the new layer. So now we got 100 units at 50, 400 units at 55, 120 units at 60, 200 units at 62. 5,000 plus 22,000 plus 7,200 plus 12,400 giving us 46,600. So that 40,600 should be what should be on the financials or the trial balance. We're going to record this to the trial balance. Remember that this amount, the purchase, is not an estimate. doesn't change whether using FIFO, LIFO, average, or perpetual or periodic. We're going to record this purchase once again. Journal entry should look familiar. We're going to say that inventory has a debit balance. We bought more of it. It's going to go up by doing the same thing, another debit. We didn't pay cash. Instead, the bad thing's going up rather than the good thing going down. Accounts payable, liability, increasing, has a credit balance. We increase it, doing the same thing, a credit. So there's our journal entry. Here's inventory. There's inventory here. It starts at 34200 It's going to go up by 12400 to 46600 Here's our accounts payable here. Here's our accounts payable there. It's starting at 41350 It's going to go up in the credit direction by 12400 to uh, 53750 The concentration, note here, inventory, 46600 supported now by our schedule, the 40000 46600 Next, we're going to take a look at our ending inventory count. So we're going to say that we counted the inventory to be 240. This is at the end of the time period. Month is over now. We're going to do a physical count. And now we do that in order to help us decide on, in a periodic system how much of this available for sale inventory, how much of these layers of inventory or the 100 plus the 400 plus the 120 plus the 200 units that we have right now, how much of those have we sold and kept? To do that, we typically look at a cost of goods sold calculation, a mandatory calculation, one that we need to understand no matter what system we are using. We can see it in terms of units. We can do the same calculation in terms of dollars. Both are something ne necessary for us to know. The format will be beginning inventory. This is the generic format that we apply all the time. Beginning inventory plus purchases. That gives us the subtotal available for sale. That subtotal representing what we had available at any given time. Doesn't mean we had that inventory uh, at any point in time, but throughout the entire month, that's how many widgets went through the warehouse. That's how many widgets we could have sold, given the fact that we had them at some point during that time process. Then we're going to subtract from that our count, our ending inventory, which we would get from the physical count here. And if this is what we had available throughout the time period, and this is what we still have at the end of it, the difference between those two will be our cost of goods sold. So it's beginning inventory plus purchases gives us goods available for sale. 
minus ending, in, ending inventory gives us cost of goods sold. Note that we this is just a subtotal. You could eliminate this if you just want a formula for um, algebraic reasons because questions could ask this in any format. They could you know, give you all the numbers except one of these and you just write out this same algebraic equation in order to solve it. What you don't want to do is to figure out and memorize an equation for purchases. You just want to say that if purchases is the unknown, then we're going to use the same formula, write it out algebraically, and solve for purchases. If they don't give you beginning inventory, then you want to write out this same formula and solve for beginning inventory. So you could just call it beginning inventory plus purchases minus ending inventory equals cost of goods sold and write that formula out. You do, however, need to know what available uh, goods available for sale is or need to be able to interpret that subtotal because it is often uh, used in questions and in practice. So in our problem, the beginning inventory was $100 or 100 units at $5,000. So we're going to start with units, 100 units. And then we purchased, and this is the reason we have this purchases broke out separately, 400 plus 120 plus 200, giving us 720. That'll give us the available for sale, 720 plus 100, or 820. That means that we had 820 units that went through the widget warehouse at some point in time, and therefore could have been sold at uh, during this period this month. Then we're going to do the physical count. We counted what's still in the widget warehouse, and there's so 240 still there. So if there's 240 still there and we could have sold 820, the difference then is 580, or cost of goods sold. Now note that it could have, something else could have happened. We could have lost them. We could have damaged some damaged goods or what a spoiled goods or whatever. But we're assuming that under the periodic system, and that's one of the, the faults of a periodic system, that it's so it's sales that happened here this this number is due to us selling things and the shrinkage of other things that could have happened hopefully is immaterial uh, the perpetual system when we do the same calculation is primarily or one major purpose of it is not to record the inventory but to detect that kind of shrinkage and and problems with the inventory now if if we knew exactly that these inventories were all purchased for the same amount, then we could just do an easy conversion and figure out what the dollar amount is. However, they're not purchased for the same amount. This was 50, 55, 60, 62. These are all the same widgets, but because purchased at different times, they cost different amounts. So that's our problem here. So doing the conversion will get a little bit tricky. Let's go through it. Same calculation, cost of goods sold calculation with dollars. We started with $5,000 worth, because we can do that conversion. That's where we started at the end of the last time period. Then we had purchases of uh, 720 and in dollars, we know exactly what we're going to pay. It was 22, 7,002, 12,004. Even though these are different dollar amounts, we know exactly what they're going to pay. It's not an assumption. There's no difference in either method. FIFO, LIFO, average, perpetual, periodic, we're gonna, we're got, we bought 41,600 of purchases. So the goods available for sale then is 46,600, 5,000 plus 41,600. That's what we have here. That's basically what we've been tracking on our worksheet. What we don't have is the ending inventory in units. We know that, I mean, in dollars. We know the units were 240, the units here are 240, and those consist of these uh, units, some of these units. So 240 of these units here, the 100, the 400, the 120, and the 200 that we purchased throughout, throughout this time period are still there. The question is which one of them are still there and how do we break out this uh, number, 46,600, between ending inventory and cost of goods sold. And that's what we'll do. That's where this uh, cost flow assumption will come into play, the last in, first out assumption. So we have the last in first out assumption. Now note you could kind of view this from either a uh, ending, ending, ending inventory point of view or a cost of goods sold point of view. Meaning you could say, hey, ending inventory is 240. And if I sold the uh, last in was the first out, I would have sold these ones first, the 200, and therefore figure out how much of them are still left. Go back up here and try to 
say this 200 this 100 would, would be there and try to get up to this ending inventory of 240 or you can do what we're going to do here we're going to say there's 580 that were sold according to the number of units and therefore we're going to go into this column the column we haven't used the entire time period the, the cost of goods sold column and figure out the cost of goods sold not for one single time period but for the entire month the month of march so we're going to make our assumption here here's our layers they cost 50, 55, 60, and 62. Here we have our cost flow worksheet again. We've got the 100 units at 50, the 400 at 55, the 120 at 60, and the 200 at 62. We could take this, we could look at that ending inventory and try to decide how much is left. We're talking about a last in, first out system. Therefore, these are the last ones we purchased at the bottom. Those would be the first out. So we can think of what's left and we can start saying, okay, this 100 would still be there because those would be the last to go. So of 240 that are still there, that uh, 100 would be there and then see how much would be left of 140 of this layer would be left. Or we can think of it first as the cost of goods sold. What did we sell? This is the new thing that we haven't been dealing with with this entire problem until now. The column we would be dealing with on a perpetual basis at the point of sale under a perpetual system but under a periodic system we're only going to be recording at the end of the time period so we've got the cost of goods sold then 580 meaning we sold 580 units so we could record over here which ones we sold meaning under a last in first out the last ones being at the bottom we're going to count up from 200 up until we get to 580 and eliminate what we had in inventory in this format. Note you might be thinking well that's a little backwards why would we be selling the last ones first what kind of company would want to sell the last inventory first and the assumption probably is not uh, as as accurate in terms of the actual flow of inventory or at least the desired flow of inventory but because it's just an assumption uh, we we don't know which inventory was sold. We're not tracking them. They could have they could have taken any of the inventory. They're all the same types of widgets. Therefore, we can make the argument that a last in first out method is just as plausible as a first in first out method, given the fact that we just don't know. And so here we go. We're going to say that the uh, 200 here is going to be wiped out first. Those are the first units sold. So we're going to say these are going to be gone at 62. So the 62 is pulling over. And that's the 12,004. That's part of the cost of goods sold, part of the 580 units we sold. Here's the dollar amount related to 200 units of that 580. Then we're going to say that this 120, these are going to be wiped out as well at $60. If we multiply that out, that's the 7,200. Those have all been sold. Now we're at 320. We need to get to 580. So we're going to go into this 400 and pick out as many as we need to get there. We could do the math of 580 minus 120 minus 200 gives us 260, or in other words, 260 plus 120 plus 200 gives us the goal of 580. Those are how many units we sold. So these 260 will be at $55. If we multiply that out at 260 times 55, we get the 14,300. The 12,4 plus the 7,002 plus the 14,300, that is our cost of goods sold for the entire time period, the entire month, the month of March. Then we're going to figure out what is left, how much is still in ending inventory. And so what we're going to do there, it seems a little bit bad, it's a little bit more difficult to think about this than the first in, first out, where we could just kind of compare uh, top to bottom. We can compare here, we can say, well, this bottom layer is wiped out. I'm going to leave some space and I'm going to put the entire four columns here. So of the four columns, the 200 is what we did first. So this 200 right here time, uh, minus the 200 means we have zero of those left at 62. Those are gone. Of the uh, 120, here's the 120. 120 minus 120 is zero. Those are gone at 60. So these at 60, there's none left. And then of the 400, the 400 and minus the 260 gives us 140 left that will still be there. Those are at the 55. 140 times 55 means we have ending inventory of 7,700. 7, 
and then of the 100 of course those are all going to be brought down here they haven't been touched and there's the 50 and there it is and so that's going to be the effect of the last in first out we might have this old layer on there forever because if we never if we always have new layers we never get to sell that old layer and over time this fifty dollars will be quite low <laughs> in comparison to what they actually cost at some at some point in the future now we can populate this information over here we're going to say ending inventory well if we add this up we got the five thousand plus the seven thousand seven hundred everything below this line is where we're working with now twelve thousand seven hundred that's going to be the ending inventory we can now ca calculate cost of goods sold as either cost of goods available for sale 46,600 minus 12,700 or take the same amount should be the same 12,004 plus 7,002 plus 14,003 will give us that 33,900. Now we'll do the adjusting entry that entry we haven't been doing under the periodic system which we would see under a perpetual system reducing the inventory and recorded the related cost of goods sold at the point of sale under a perpetual system not being done until now until the end of the month the end of March in this case in a periodic system. So note that when we make a sale under a perpetual system we record the first half of the journal entry increasing the accounts receivable and increasing revenue debit accounts receivable and credit revenue what we do under a perpetual system that we don't do under a periodic is at the point of sale record the decrease in inventory and related cost of goods sold and in a periodic system we'll do that at the end of the process so we're recording that second half not for one transaction only however but for the entire period the entire month the month of march we can see that, of course, the inventory now before that time period is overstated, as is, well, the cost of goods sold is understated. It's at zero right now until uh, we make this adjustment. So the adjustment will be inventory has a debit balance. We need to make it go down for all the sales we have made through the month of March. So we're going to do the opposite thing to it, a credit. Cost of goods sold is an expense account, and so we need to make it go up for the expense of what we have consumed, inventory in order to help us generate this revenue over the month of March. So we will debit cost of goods sold, debiting the expense, crediting inventory. So this is gonna be that journal entry that, uh, journal entry that, again, we would see this form every time we make a sale under a periodic, under a perpetual system, every time we make a sale. However, under a periodic system, we only see it at the end of the time period, recording the cost of goods sold and the reduction in inventory for the entire month in accordance with the physical count so that's how we determined what uh, the adjustment will be it's going to be coming from this cost of goods sold so once we post it we're going to record the cost of goods sold and the reduction of inventory the reduction of in inventory then should result in an ending inventory of 12,700 you can see that we have currently 46,600 which is our goods available for sale which we are now allocating between what is left in ending inventory and what has been sold and is uh, now in cost of goods sold the income statement account so if we post this out then we're going to say cost of goods sold started at zero it's going up by 33,900 to 33,900 inventory started at 46,600 it's going down by 33,900 to 12,700 that 12.7 matches what's on our worksheet here, as does the 33.9 in cost of goods sold. If we look at the full uh, transaction, then we can see that our inventory is much lower than before this end period adjustment, and, and our cost of goods sold is much higher, which brings net income down substantially. So net income was 40,180 before this, went down by 33,900 to 6,280. So until we record this adjustment under a periodic system, we can't rely on our net income number. It's going to be completely wrong because the cost of goods sold is the biggest expense typically for a merchandising company. Our assets will be way overstated as well because they will not be recording the inventory being decreased as sales happen until the end of the time period. So it will be a good system at the end of the time period once this adjustment has been made. If we look at all the components here, we can see our, our matching of the cost of goods equation. We've got the ending inventory here, the ending inventory on our worksheet, 
and the ending inventory on the trial balance. We have the cost of goods sold and the cost of goods sold calculation. The cost of goods sold would be the same number here, 12,004 plus 7,002 plus 14,003 adds up to 33,900. And we see it here in the cost of goods sold on the trial balance. In this presentation, we will discuss the weighted average inventory method using a periodic system. The weighted average method as opposed to a first in first out or last in first out method. The periodic system as opposed to a perpetual system. We want to keep the other systems in mind as we work through this comparing and contrasting. We're going to be working with this worksheet entering this information here. It's important to note that this worksheet is a worksheet that can typically be used with any of these inventory flow type problems of which there are many. We have first in, first out, last in, first out, the average method, and then we have a perpetual and periodic system which can be used with any of those methods. It's also possible for questions to ask for just one component such as cost of goods sold or ending inventory and therefore it can seem like there's more types of problems that we can have in that format as well. If we set up everything in a standard way, even if that weighs a little bit longer for some types of problems, it may be easier because we can just memorize that one format to set things up. This would be a format to do that. This would be breaking up the information into three components, purchases, cost of merchandise sold, and inventory or ending inventory. Within those three components, we're going to have the quantity, the unit cost, and then the total cost in, in each of these three sections. And then we'll enter the data through this worksheet as we go, starting this time with the beginning inventory. So this is where we start at the beginning of the month, in this case, the month of March. We're going to say the beginning inventory is 100 units, costing $50, 100 times 50 being 5,000. We're going to put that same 5,000 out to the total column. Just to give an indication as we go through this worksheet of what the total is in its own distinct column out in the total section. So there we have that 5,000 units. That's where we start. If we look at our trial balance, it will be in order. Assets, li liabilities, equity, revenue, and expenses. Debits, non-bracketed or positive numbers. Credits, bracketed or negative numbers. The debits minus the credits equaling this, zero. We have net loss in this case, meaning revenue of zero minus these expenses, five, three, and 9,920, giving us a loss of 10,720. We're focusing here, of course, this time being the inventory on inventory. This 5,000 matching what we just put into our worksheet, that is our beginning balance. That's where we start. Next, we will have a purchase of 400 units at $55. We're going to put that into our worksheet in the purchasing section. Remember that the purchases will not differ no matter what method we will be making, whether that's FIFO, LIFO, average, perpetual, or periodic. It will be what it is in March. It was 400 units that we purchased at $55. Notice the rising prices from 50 to 55 for the inventory units we are purchasing. Same units, costs going up. That's going to be the standard assumption that will happen. You want to just remember it going one way as if cost increase would be the norm. And then if it goes the other way, then we can kind of just reverse some of the effects that would happen. So in other words, as costs rise, what's going to be the effect on ending inventory and cost of goods sold under the three methods, LIFO, FIFO, and average, and then reverse the effects, obviously, when costs then fall. So we're going to have the 400 times the 55, that'll be the 22,000. Then we're going to do our average calculation. Now it's possible since we're doing a periodic system to just do all of the purchases and then calculate the average at the end. But we're going to calculate the average as we go to get practice calculating the average. It can be something that uh, people find a little bit more confusing because of the weighted average that we will be using. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate our average by putting the calculation all under this line, under this date line. Again, moving this amount down. So there's our 100 units at 50 or 5,000. Uh, then we're going to move this column over and there's our 400 units at 55. So we started at 100 units at 50. We got 400 units at 55. What we want to do now is create the average. Now I'm going to show the wrong way to do this first of all and then we'll uh, calculate the weighted average. So the a normal average of just the two prices would be 50 plus 55. Those two numbers divided by two 
would give us an amount right in the middle of them at 5250 which seems reasonable 5250 seems reasonable however it's not exactly right because there's a lot more of the 55 units 400 than the 50 units 100 and therefore the weighted average taking that into account would be closer to the 55 than to the 50. so that's the mistake we just have to kind of avoid how are we going to do this we're going to take the total here the total dollar we spent and the total units and then divide those out so it can look, look a little bit confusing on the worksheet because we're first going to calculate or sum up the units 100 and 400 we're not going to sum up the uh, unit cost that doesn't really make any sense because it's the unit cost we can sum up the total here 5,000 and 22,000 for 27,000 and then take this 27,000 divided by 500 so now we're simply taking the 27,000 divided by 500 and that gives us the 54 which is closer to this number that's the weighted at the 400 units so we get 54 as our total if we pull that out to the outer column then the 27,000 what is what should be on our financial statements in ending inventory and our trial balance we're going to record the journal entry here now here's going to be our new thing that happened we purchased another uh, 400 units for 22 we're going to uh, adjust inventory inventory has a debit balance we're going to make it go up by doing the same thing to it another debit of 22,000 then the other side's not decreasing cash but increasing the liability accounts payable therefore we will increase accounts payable by the 22,000 posting this out then we have the inventory inventory is up here it started at 5,000 it's going to go up by the 22,000 to 27,000 then we have the accounts payable accounts payable 12,150 going up by 22,000 to 34,150 Note, once again, this transaction is going to be the same no matter what method we are using. If we see everything here, we're going to say that we're still in balance. No effect on net income. The purchase of inventory was not expensed at the time of purchase. It will be expensed, but not till it's used in order to generate revenue in accordance with the matching principle. That will be when cost, when we sell it in the form of cost of goods sold. However, under a periodic system, we're not going to be, get around to recording that cost of goods sold until the end of the time period, until we do a physical count, the end of the month, the end of March in this case. Next transaction, we're going to say that there's a sale of 420 units at $85. Now, if we were using a perpetual inventory system, we would have to record the reduction of inventory and the cost of goods sold along with the sale into our worksheet. We're not looking at the worksheet here because we're in a periodic system and we're not going to record that component until the end of the period with a physical count. What we will record is just the journal entry, just to demonstrate uh, this journal entry, the sales journal entry, which will be the same under the two methods, a periodic and perpetual, the second piece being the difference. So remember that if we make a sale on a merchandising company, we typically assume that it's going to be a perpetual system and we often break out that journal entry when considering it and thinking about it into two journal entries meaning we have the sales side and then we have the um the inventory or cost of goods sold side of the journal entry the sales side we can think of as similar as if we were a merchandising company and we can just eliminate the inventory and say hey what would happen if we uh, had a sale or did services and got paid or on account meaning we got an accounts receivable what would be the journal entry cash is not affected accounts receivable has a debit balance we got more of it people owe us money therefore accounts receivable will go up with another debit so we're going to debit accounts receivable and then we're going to credit something and the something will be revenue that revenue for a service company might be fees earned or if it might be revenue or income <laughs> and it could be called sales for a merchandising company but it's all just a revenue account so it's going to go up in the credit direction this is kind of our normal journal entry that we see whenever we make a sale whether it be merchandise or a service type business uh, account receivable going up revenue going up then we have the second component that we typically think of when we make a sale as a merchandiser meaning we sold merchandise inventory should be going down and the related cost of goods sold should be going up we're not going to record this under a periodic system that's the difference between a periodic system and perpetual system 
We're only going to record the decrease in inventory and related cost of goods sold expense at the point at the end of the period, the end of the month in this case, the end of March, uh, after we do a physical count. Why? Why would we do that? Why would we not decrease the inventory? We know the inventory went down, and it's probably just the sophistication of the system. If uh, we if we're, have a clerk or someone recording these sales, it's easy to know what the sales price is, but this sales price has nothing to do with the cost of goods sold, or in other words, the cost of goods sold might have been used to make that sales price, but uh, this there's no direct relationship between these two things. The sales price is known when we make the sale, so 420 times 85, that's the 35,700. That's what we want to focus on, collecting the revenue and making the sale at the point of sale. We don't want to spend all of our time training people how to record the, the cost of goods sold or inventory if they have to do it manually, because that could take some time, especially if there's multiple products that we are selling. If, however, it's an electronic scanner system that does it at that point in time without us even needing to know what the cost is, then that makes it a lot more doable to do a perpetual system which would be better from an accounting standpoint. If we don't have that sophistication, we may be using a periodic system, which will simplify the process, but we know that it won't be entirely accurate until the end of the time period. So if we post this out, then accounts receivable, debit balance, we're posting this 35,000 to it, going from 44,900 up by 35,700 to 80,600, then the revenue is going up from zero. We're posting this revenue up from zero by 35,700 to 35,700. If we look at our full transaction, we're back in balance. Net income is going up uh, drastically. It went up a lot. It went up by 35,700. So 35,700 minus these expenses is 24,980. So that's going to be our net income. Note it's really not exactly correct now, of course, because we haven't recorded the cost of goods sold. And that's going to be a substantial expense that we haven't recorded. We haven't recorded the decrease in inventory, so our assets are overstated. We will do so at the end of the time period, the end of the month, the end of March. Next, we have on 318, purchased 120 units at $60 per unit. So once again, we'll be in the purchases column. This will be the same as in any method, first in, first out, last in, first out, average, perpetual, periodic. These purchases are what they are. This is what we will actually pay for the inventory. We're going to have the 120 units at $60. Note the rising prices from 50 to 55 to 60. That's not because the units got better. That's not because we're buying better widgets or better inventory. The price is just going up, and that's going to be the standard. Uh, prices increase in the standard for these types of problems, the standard for practice uh, as well due to inflation, if nothing else. The 120 times the 60 will give us the 7,200. Now we're going to calculate the average once again. Remember that if we're doing a periodic system, we could uh, calculate the average basically at the end and uh, sum up all of them, but I want to calculate the average each time we make a new step because this is the most complex component typically. What we're going to do is draw a line here. We're going to bring this amount down. So this is what we had before. We had 500 units at $54. That's uh, 27,000. Then we're going to pull over the new information. Here's the new information. What we are not going to do when calculating the average, what you want to avoid, be careful of, is to just take the amounts, the 54 plus the 60. The 54 being the old uh, average plus what our new inventory costs and taking that and dividing it by two. What's the problem with that? It looks like a reasonable number, but it's not taking into account the weighted average. It's not taking into account that we have 500 units at 54 and only 120 at 60, and therefore this number should not be right in the middle, but leaning towards the 54. So instead, what we're gonna do is sum up the total units we have, the 500 and the 120, then sum up the total dollar amount that we paid for those units, uh, 34200 And then we'll do the division problem, that division problem being the 34200 divided by the 620 units, giving us a number of 5516. Note it's not going to round specifically to the penny. That's okay. That happens in practice. Uh, we're going to round it to the penny because we're talking about dollars and cents here. 
So we're going to say that uh, calculate that. That's that number here is going to be this number divided by this number, or the total dollar amount divided by the quantity. So that's going to give us the thirty-four thousand two hundred that we want to get to on our trial balance now in our financial statements. We're going to do that recording the journal entry. The journal entry will be the same under any method, FIFO, LIFO, average, because it is a purchase. That's not the side that differs. The side that's differing is when we make the sale. So we're going to say that uh, inventory has a debit balance. We need to make it to go up. So we're going to do the same thing to it. Another debit. So here's the debit to inventory. The other side's not going to be paid with cash. We're going to increase the liability. So the liability has a credit balance. We're going to increase the accounts payable, therefore, by a credit of 7200 Posting this out then, we have the inventory in the journal entry. The inventory up here in the assets, we started with 27000 It's going to go up by 7200 to 34200 Then we have the accounts payable. We have the accounts payable here. It's at 34150 We're going to increase it in the credit direction, 7200 to 41350 so there's going to be our transaction. This 34,200 matches what we just calculated on our worksheet, the 34,200, the inventory worksheet supporting the inventory amount reported on the trial balance or the balance sheet. Here's going to be the full transaction. We still have the 34,200. We're back in balance indicated by the green zeros. No effect on net income, no effect on these accounts, the revenue or expense accounts. We will be affecting the revenue expense accounts by the inventory that we purchased, not at the point of purchase, but at the time we sell the inventory in the form of cost of goods sold. However, under the periodic system, we won't be recording that until the end of the period when we do the physical count. We're going to do another purchase here, purchase 200 units at $62. So we are going to be in the purchases column once again, the $200 per 200 unit purchase. At $62, note the rising prices going from 50 to 55 to 60 to 62. Same units, unit cost going up because of, if nothing else, inflation. That will be the norm. You want to think that it can go down, but you probably want to think the norm will be increasing prices and then reverse your thought process for it to go down. The 200 times the 62 gives us 12,400. We're going to calculate our average now. And we could do this at the end of the time period under a periodic system for the average method. We're going to do it as we go, this being the key component to the average system calculating that average cost. To do so, we're going to draw a line under our last date line, and we're going to be putting this new information here, taking this 620 down, just copying that down, and then we're going to pull over our new information. And once again, we're going to say what not to do, which is a common, common error in calculating this. And that's going to be taking the 55.16 plus the 62 or the two prices and just dividing by two. That's an average, but it's not the weighted average because it's right in the middle of those two costs. And it should be leaning towards the 620, it being weighted higher, it having more inventory in it. So what we're going to do instead is we'll sum up the 620 and the 200 to get the 200, the 820. Then we'll sum up the 34,200 and the $12,400 amount to get to the 46,600. And then we can do our average. We're going to take the total dollar amount, the 46,600, divided by the 820 units, giving us an average of 56,83, rounding up not worrying about the fact that we have all these decimals we're going to use the rounding to the pennies talking dollars and cents so that's going to give us the 5683 that's going to be this number divided by this number there's the total that we are going to be reporting on the financial statements we will now record the journal entry for that new purchase the purchase of the 12400 remember that the journal entry will be the same under lifo fifo average periodic perpetual all of them this is not an estimate we're going to say that the inventory started at uh, the debit balance and we're going to increase it. We bought more inventory with a debit of that 12400 We're going to credit not cash, but the liability of accounts payable, increasing the accounts payable. Posting this out, we have the inventory here going to the inventory there, starting at 34200 increasing by 12400 going to a total of 46600 Here's the accounts payable there. It's going to be posted here. We've got a credit balance starting at 41350 increasing 12400 to 
53,750. Noting that the inventory that we end up with is supported by our inventory worksheet. Now we're going to do the inventory count at the end of the time period. This is what we're going to do in a periodic system in order to record the cost of goods sold for the entire period, what we have not been doing for the entire period, and record the related reduction in inventory, something we haven't done. So you'll note that as we go in our worksheet, we've just been doing purchases and we've been increasing and increasing with purchases, not recording the decrease in the inventory for these sales. And we're going to do that at the end of the time period due to and with the help of a physical count and the cost of goods sold calculation. Cost of goods sold calculation, a mandatory calculation, something we really have to know, both in terms of units and in terms of dollars. The format will look like this. Beginning inventory plus purchases gives us goods available for sale or amount available for sale minus the ending inventory will give us cost of goods sold. That's going to be our calculation. Now note that uh, a multiple choice question might ask you for any component, just give you three, uh, one unknown for this formula. They might give you the beginning inventory as the unknown, for example, or the purchases as the unknown. Now you could write this formula as beginning inventory plus purchases, skip the subtotal, beginning inventory plus purchases minus ending inventory equals cost of goods sold, and write it out as an algebraic equation Given any of these unknowns then, as long as we only have one, we would then be able to find out any of these uh, amounts. So keep that in mind. You don't want to remember multiple different equations to figure out, for example, purchases or beginning inventory. You want to remember one equation, <laughs> cost of goods sold, that can answer any of those types of questions. Uh, you do need to know this subtotal, however, by name, even if you don't use it in the equation, if, if you pull it out for an, an equation. Uh, because some problems will refer to it as well as in practice. We're going to do this calculation first for the units, and then we'll do the same calculation in terms of dollars. We started off with 100 units. That's what we began with. We purchased 720 units, 400 plus 120 plus the 200 in the purchases section. That gives us 820 available. That doesn't mean we had 820 at any given time in our warehouse. But within the widget warehouse, we had 820 go through it, meaning we started with 100, we purchased 720. We may have sold items throughout here. We don't know what we sold, but we know what we purchased and therefore had available for sale, hence the name, goods available for sale, and that's 820. Then we're going to do the physical count. So we're going to say there's 240 widgets left in the widget warehouse. So there's 240 left. So if we had 820, we could have sold 240 are still there given our physical count. Then the difference between the two is 580. That's what we sold in terms of the widgets. It is possible that we had shrinkage or theft of, or spoilage or something as well, which is why the perpetual system uh, would be nice to use because it can ver verify or better verify that type of problem. Uh, but our assumption is it's sold, and the assumption is that the shrinkage of any kind, breakage, theft, is uh, immaterial in, in relation to it, and therefore we're going to record this entire amount to cost of goods sold. So note what we did here. We just basically said, hey, this is the amount we had available, and then allocated it out between either what's still left in ending inventory and what has been sold. We're going to do that same thing with dollars. It would be a very easy conversion if the dollar amount were the same throughout the entire period, but very often it is not, even though we're talking about the same widgets. We're not buying different types of things. It's all the same, but the dollar amounts are increasing. So that makes it a little bit difficult. If we see this, then we're going to say, well, we started with $5,000. That's our beginning balance. We know that. We purchased 720 and we purchased them for 41,600. We can't convert from 720 to 416 easily because of the different dollar amounts. But we know what we purchased. We can just look at the GL and say, hey, we, we increased inventory. That's how much we're going to pay. It's not an estimate. This is what we're going to pay. 22000 plus 7002 plus 12004 That's a given. That's not an estimate. And so if we add those two up, we're at 46600 That's where we stop. Now we're going to allocate that out between ending inventory and cost of goods sold. However, uh, we know that there's 240 units that were still in ending inventory. But now we have to figure out our conversion here because we need to know which of those uh, units we purchased some for 50 some for 55 some for 60 some for 62 that's what we'll do now in the average method 
And the average method, because we've been calculating it as we go, is nice and easy right now. We're just going to say, well, yeah, some of them cost 50, 55, 52, 60, whatever. But they all cost around about an average, if we averaged them all out, a weighted average of $56.63. So we're going to say whatever we sold, in this case, uh, 580 units. Those 580, we sold for this 56.83 about. If we multiply 580 times 56.83, we get 32,960.93. And that's our cost of goods sold. This is the cost of goods sold we haven't been recording the entire time period. It's the cost of goods sold that we would record every time we make a sale under a perpetual system. The cost of goods sold we are now recording for all sales happening during the time period. In our case, the month, the month of February, March, month of March. So we have uh, 820 units that we had before minus the eight, the 580 means we still have left 240. So we did this allocation of the 820 units. 580 have been sold and 240 are still left. They are at 5683. If we multiply 240 times the 5683, we get 136902. So now we can fill out the rest of this form. We can say, okay, the ending inventory is 13,639.02. And we could subtract this out then. And notice we did take off the rounding here. So here we have the pennies. Here we remove the pennies. It's just rounding. So if we take off the 46,600 minus 13,639, we get the 32,961, which is also matching this amount, 32,960 rounding 961 so that's how that ties out we're going to do our final journal entry now this would be the journal entry that we would see under a perpetual system every time we record a sale or a similar one at least one that would be reducing inventory and recording cost of goods sold uh, but under a periodic system as we are doing now we will only see it one time at the end of the period whatever period that may be for our case the month the month of march so we're going to record the reduction of inventory for the entire time period Inventory is a debit balance. We're going to make it go down by doing the opposite thing, a credit. And the related cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold is an expense. It's going to go up in the debit direction, bringing net income down. So here's the cost of goods sold. And there's the inventory. So once again, this is the journal entry we would see each time under a periodic system as we record sales. It's going to be the second half of the sales transaction. But under a perpetual, under a periodic, under a that would be the case under a perpetual system but under a periodic system we're only going to record it for the entire sales all sales made during the period at the end so if we record this here's cost of goods sold here's cost of goods sold here it's going to go from zero way up by the 32,961 to 32,961 here's inventory here's inventory it's at 46,600 it's going to go way down by 32,961 to 13,639 this number now matching the 13,000 in ending inventory. This number now matching our cost of goods sold calculation. So note that before we did this transaction, our net income was way too high and now it's way lower. So that's going to be the case for the periodic system. Our, our net income cannot be trusted until we do this transaction, the cost of goods sold being huge for a merchandising company typically. Also, our assets will be way overstated until we do this end of period adjustment because once again the inventory is typically a fairly large asset and uh, it's not being reduced as we make the sales so we got to wait till the end of the period to have an accurate number there if we look at the comparisons here's our calculation here's our worksheet here's our trial balance we can see that we have the ending inventory here we have the ending inventory on the uh, trial balance which would be on the financial statement we have the ending inventory on our worksheet. We have the cost of goods sold here on the cost of goods sold calculation, cost of goods sold on our merchandise uh, cost of goods sold worksheet. And then we have the cost of goods sold here on our uh, trial balance as well, which would also be on the income statement. Hello, in this lecture, we're going to be taking a look at first in, first out inventory method. We will be selling coffee mugs and we won't be specifically identifying the coffee mugs in this case. As we've talked about in a prior lecture, this time we're going to be using a cost flow assumption. That cost flow assumption being the first in, first out assumption this time. 
To set up this problem in any cost flow assumption, I highly recommend putting together a worksheet. That worksheet including headers of purchases columns, then we got the cost of merchandise columns, then we have the ending inventory. I highly recommend setting up a worksheet like this, whether it's by hand or in a computer or in Excel, because it answers all the types of questions that could come up with an inventory cost flow type of assumption. Within those sections, we will then have the quantity and then the unit cost and the total cost. We're gonna ask if we sell something, we're calculating the cost of that sale. We're gonna same thing, we're gonna have the quantity, the unit cost, and the total cost. And then the ending inventory, we're saying what is left. Again, we can represent that with the quantity, the unit cost. And then I have two costs uh, totals here because there's going to be different layers. So we're, the first cost is going to be the cost per layer. The second cost, we're going to be adding up total layer. That'll make more sense as we go. We're going to start off here with inventory on the trial balance represented in terms of dollars of 5000 Trial balance represented in terms of dollars. Remember that when we look at inventory, it's going to be represented in terms of units. And we're going to have to convert those units into dollars. So when we see it on the trial balance, we need to back that number up in a similar way that we needed to back up, say, the accounts receivable by customer. Who owes us that $44,900? In terms of inventory, what makes up that $5,000 worth of inventory? In this case, we're going to start off with 100 units times the $50. I know they're very expensive coffee mugs. They don't look like much, but 100 units times $50, and that's going to give us the $5,000. So that is the only layer. So that's going to be the total cost. That 5,000 represents the 5,000 on the trial balance. Let's take a look at some journal entries and see how we track this. First transaction will be the purchase of 400 more units at $55. In terms of units, that means, of course, we had 100 units. Now we purchased another 400 units, meaning we have 500 units. The journal entry is pretty straightforward because we paid for what we paid for. It's not, there's no estimate involved in the journal entry. That's the cash we paid. We paid 400 times $55. So we're going to say inventory is going up with a debit of 22,000, 5,000 plus the debit of 22,000 brings inventory on our uh, trial balance up to $27,000 worth of inventory. And then we're going to say we bought them on account. So the credit's going to go to accounts payable. We had $12,150. We're going to credit increase in accounts payable to $34,150. That's what we have at this point in time. Now, the challenge here, of course, is that we're going to have to back that number up. This $27,000 now needs to be backed up on our worksheet. Last time, we left off with one layer of 100 units at $50. Now, of course, we've got that 100 units plus the 400 to the 500 units. What we're going to do is draw a line under the prior transaction. First, we're going to say that we have purchases. The purchases are going to be 400 units in the purchases column. We purchased them for $55. Note that that's a higher cost than they were before rising prices in this case. 400 times 55 gives us that 22,000. Then in terms of ending inventory, we now have two layers. We had some that cost 100 at $50 and some that cost 55. I want to have both those layers under this red line as of the point in time of the latest transaction this purchase. Therefore, I'm just going to bring this number down. I'm just going to bring these down here. 100 units at $50 gives us that 5,000. Then we're just going to bring these over here and say the second layer was 400 units at $55 for 22,000. So the 5,000 plus the 22,000 gives us the total cost of the 27,000. That dollar amount now is what is represented on our trial balance. We have that backed up. Now, of course, the question will be when we make a sale, which ones did we sell? Did we sell the cheap ones, the old ones at $50 or the more expensive newer ones at $55? Remember that the mug itself, completely the same. It's just the increase in price due to the time period in which we purchased it. Answer, when we look at FIFO, will be the old one. The first ones that we're in will be the first ones that we're out, in this case being the cheaper ones. But we are getting ahead of ourselves, so let's take a look at a sales transaction. We're going to say we sell 420 units at $85. There's two journal entries related to the sale. Remember that the first half of the journal entry is no different. We're not tracking the sales price. If they give us the sales price in a problem, it's common for us to think, well, what does that have to do with our cost sheet? Nothing. I mean, we might have used the cost sheet to come up with the sales price, but the sales price is not what we are tracking. First half of the journal entry, nothing is different. We're going to take the 420 times the 85, and that's going to be our journal entry. In terms of the units, of course, we've got the 500 units minus the 420 gives us the 80 left. That's what we're going to have left. 
transaction for the first half of the journal entry will be the debit of the 35.7, the 420 times the 85, uh, and that will be increase in the receivable, assuming we made the sale on account. So we're increasing the receivable, and the second half of it will be the revenue account because we're earning revenue at that point in time, crediting the revenue for the 420 times the 85, increasing the revenue. This journal entry often gets neglected when we're looking at the cost flow assumption because that's not where we're focusing in on, but we need to recognize that when we make a sale, that, that journal entry is still there. That's the journal entry we normally focus on when we make the sale. What we need to track now, of course, is the decrease in the inventory. We had 27,000 in the inventory. What's the cost of those 420 units that were sold? That's when we need to go to our worksheet and say, hmm, well, we have, we're going to say these two layers, 100 units at 50, 400 units at 55. We sold 420 units, therefore we're going to be working in the cost of merchandise because that's what we're trying to calculate the cost of the goods sold here. And we're saying which ones did we sell first? Well, if we sold 420 units, we sold the old ones first under the first in first out. Those being the units at $50. There's only 100 of them. We sold 420, therefore we're wiping out that entire 100 units. We throw 100 units at 50. That's the assumption that we are making. That's given us that 5,000. This layer wiped out then we have 400 units and we sold 420 so we're gonna say the 420 minus the 100 that we took out of the prior layer means we have another 320 that are in the second layer those are at 55 dollars 320 times 55 gives us the 17.6 so 5,000 plus 17.6 that's the cost of goods a question could ask that or they could be asking what's left in ending inventory which we would then have to calculate using our worksheet here. And we're gonna say, well, there was 100 units on this layer, we sold all of them, 100 minus 100 means there's zero left, therefore zero times 50 is zero. Then we had 400 in the second layer, we sold 320 of them, leaving us with that 80, there's that 80, and those 80 that are left then are at that higher cost of 55, 80 times 55 is 4,400, the zero in the first layer and the 4,400 in the second layer gives us 4,400 that is left in ending inventory. So remember, we have two things here that are going on. A question could ask, what's the cost of goods sold? 22.6, that's the journal entry that we need to record, leaving us with what's left in ending inventory after we record that journal entry, which will be 4,400. Let's post the journal entry. So here's going to be our journal entry for the cost of goods side of the sales. And we're going to say that the inventory is going down by that 22.6 that we just calculated. And we're going to credit the inventory. So that's going to bring the inventory down to that 4,400. That's what's left. Cost of goods sold, the expense related to us using the inventory in order to help us generate revenue, 22,600. Bringing the cost of goods sold to that 22,600. There's the transaction. And we can see that that 4,400 now, of course, matches what is in our worksheet. Hello, in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the last in first out inventory method. We will once again be selling our coffee mugs here. We will not be specifically identifying the coffee mugs that we sell, but rather using a cost flow method. That method being a last in first out this time. Whenever doing a cost flow method, I do recommend setting up a worksheet such as this with three parts to it, having the purchases, the cost of the merchandise and the ending inventory and then calculating the units uh, that we're going to sell, the unit cost and the total cost for those particular categories as we will do here. This will answer the most amount of questions in any format that those questions could be asked. What we are trying to do here is of course say that the inventory that is reported on the trial balance needs to be backed up in terms of a worksheet. Why? Because on the trial balance it's reported in terms of dollars. And of course, when we think about inventory, we often think about it in terms of units. We then need to back up this dollar amount with a unit amount and the cost per unit. That's what we're doing with the cost flow assumptions. We're going to start off with 100 units. 
we're going to say those 100 units started with a cost of $50, meaning that the total cost will be $5,000, and that's the only layer we have so far, so the total is $5,000. That $5,000 now matches what is on our trial balance. That will be the purpose of this worksheet. Next, we're going to say that a purchase happened. We purchased 400 units at $55. Therefore, in terms of units, we had the 100 units. Now we purchased 400. We have 500 units. The purchase price, the journal entry for the purchase, straightforward. It's the same for FIFO or LIFO or average. It is what it is. We bought 400 units at $55. We're going to have to pay that either now or sometime in the future. There's no estimate going on in terms of the journal entry. We're going to put on the books 55 or we're going to say the $55 times the 4,000, 22,000 inventory increasing from 5,000 in the debit direction of 22,000 to 27,000. And then the other side, we're going to say we bought it on account. We'll then go to accounts payable, increasing the payable by the 22,000 to 34,150. No change with that journal entry. However, we now have this 27000 on the books in terms of inventory. We need to put that into our worksheet and be able to back that up with the amount of units that we then have. At this point in time, we had the 100 units at $50. We're going to say that we bought another 400 units. So we're going to go into the purchases column and say that we have 400 more units at the $55 for a total of 22000 we're going to have two layers. I'm going to put all the layers under this red line. This red line represented the last transaction. We want to have everything in Indian inventory under this red line as of the end of this process. Therefore, we're going to bring that 100 units at $50 down and we're going to pull this 400 at $55 over. Therefore, we have 100 units that cost 50, 400 units that cost 55 for a total of 5,000 plus the 22 given us that 27,000. That, of course, is the amount that we have on our trial balance. So we have now backed up the dollar amount using our worksheet. Now the question will be when we make a sale, which ones did we sell? The older ones at, at 100 units at 50 or the newer ones at $55. Under LIFO, we will be selling the newer units. You would think we'd want to sell the older ones first, but it's just an inventory assumption. And if we don't know which ones were that we actually sold, we can make whatever assumption we want. In this case, we're making the assumption that we sold the newer ones. But once again, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's take a look at a sales transaction in which we sell 420 units at $85. So we had 500 units minus the 420 units. In terms of units, we are then going to have the 80 units left after this process. The sales journal entry often is overlooked when we focus on the cost of goods sold because we're looking at the cost, not the sales price. So when we see this $85 in a problem, when we spent so much time working on the cost sheet, we may try to figure out how that 85 ties into the cost sheet. It doesn't. So when we do this first journal entry of the two sales journal entries, there's really no difference that happens. We're going to say the sales price that's going to be on the sticker price times the number of units 420 means that we're going to have accounts receivable, assuming we sold it on accounts of the 35.7, the 420 times the 85, that will increase the receivable and the revenue will then be the same amount for the 420 crediting revenue, increasing revenue for the amount that we sold. How much did the inventory go down by in terms of dollars and how much of the cost of goods sold should we report? We know the number of units that we sold. We don't know the cost of those units without our worksheet. So let's go to our worksheet. We're going to say another red line here. We have these two layers. We've got the 100 units at 50, the 400 at 55. Which one of those are we going to take pull from first, assuming we use a last in first out assumption if we sold 420 of them? Answer is the last ones we purchased. So the 400, the newer ones, we're going to say in our cost of goods sold column, we're going to say we sold the entire 400 units and those cost $55. 400 times 55 will give us the 22,000. We sold 420 total. So if we sold 400 and wiped out that layer, we're going to have to sell the rest, 420 minus 400, or 20, to give us the total of 420. And that's going to be of the $50 units, and that will give us 20 times 50 of 1,000. So this is the calculation of the cost of goods sold, of 22 plus the 1,000. And now we're going to have to figure out what is going to be left. What's going to be left? Well, of that 400 units, we sold all of them. So that second layer, I'm going to take that off first. That's gone. 
of the first layer, we had 100 units, we sold 20 of them, 100 minus 20 gives us that 80 that are left at the $50, 80 times 50 is that 4,000, and then of course the 4,000 plus the 100 gives us that 4,000. After we do this journal entry, the cost of goods sold journal entry, 23,000, we will then be left with in Indian inventory on the trial balance, a dollar amount of 4,000. Let's see that process. So we're going to do the second half of the journal entry, reducing inventory, recording cost of goods sold for the amount we just discussed. Inventory going down by 23,000, crediting 23,000, bringing inventory from 27,000 down by 23,000 to that 4,000. And then we're going to debit the cost of goods sold, second half of that journal entry, and that will increase the cost of goods sold, bringing down net income. Now, of course, the point being is that after we recorded that cost of goods sold half and the reduction in the inventory, we are then left with $4,000 worth of inventory, the amount that matches our inventory worksheet. Hello, in this lecture we're going to be talking about the average inventory cost method. We will be selling our coffee mugs again. We will not be using a specific identification, but rather a cost flow assumption. That assumption being the average method. We will be using the same worksheet. I highly recommend working a worksheet such as this when, when doing any cost flow assumption for inventory, which will include a purchases section, a cost of merchandise section, and an ending inventory section in which pieces we can then calculate the unit cost times the quantity to give the total cost for each of the sections. This could answer the most amount of questions that can be asked for this top. If we take a look at a trial balance, we can see that the inventory on the trial balance is at 5,000. That's $5,000 worth of inventory. What we need to do is convert that and be able to see that in terms of units because we often think of inventory as units. For example, 100 units here. How do we convert that to the $5,000 worth on the trial balance? That's what we need our worksheet for in order to back up that number on the trial balance on the balance sheet. What we're going to start off with is the 100 units at $50. Yes, they're expensive coffee mugs here. And that's going to be $5,000. That's the total of the $5,000 that is on the trial balance. That's where we will then start. We're going to have a purchase of 400 units at $55. So in terms of units, of course, we had the 100. We now purchase 400. We have 500 units. The journal entry to record that is straightforward. It's the same under all the methods that we have been using. There's no estimate for the journal entry related to the purchase because we purchased it for whatever we purchased it for. In this case, 400 times 55. So if we purchased it on account, we're going to have a debit to the inventory of the 22,000, which will increase the inventory from 5,000 by 22,000 to that 27,000. And the credit will be to accounts payable. We're going to pay it sometime in the future the liability then increasing at that point. This 27,000 is a straightforward journal entry, but it's not so straightforward to think about what the worksheet will be. We're gonna have to put this, of course, on the worksheet. We need to back up that $27,000 worth in terms of units. Last time we had the 100 units at $50. Now, of course, we're going to put on the new purchase of 400 units at $55. That gives us the $22,000 worth, 400 times the 55. We are going to do a similar process in terms of pulling the layers down as we did last time, but then we're going to calculate the average method. So we're going to put the first layer down. We still have the 100 units at $50. We have the second layer of 400 at $55. But when we sell the units, we're not going to sell them in terms of which $50 units or $55 units. We want to have an average here. We just want to say they all cost about some amount. You might be tempted to take an average of 50 plus 55 divided by two. That doesn't necessarily work because it's not a weighted average. You'll note that there's a lot more units, 100 units at, I'm sorry, there's a lot more units at the 55, 400 units, than there are at the 50, 100 units. Therefore, we need to calculate the weighted average. The way to do this on this worksheet is to calculate the total quantity, 100 plus 400, 500 units, 
the total cost, the 22 plus the 5 being 27,000. So we have 27,000 total cost, 500 units. 27,000 divided by 500 means that all the units cost about, yeah, $54. Therefore, when we make the sale, we're just going to say that they cost about $54 at this point. That's going to give us the total, which we can calculate a couple different ways. It was the 5 plus the 22, and of course now, the 500 times the 54 equals that 27,000, our average. That average is, of course, what's on the trial balance at the 27,000 in inventory. Now let's record our transactions for a sale. We have a sale of the 420 units at $85. In terms of units, we're saying it's the 500 units minus the 420 gives us 80 units that are left over. The sale, remember, has two separate journal entries. The first half of the journal entry, straightforward, because the sales price has nothing to do with the cost worksheet that we have been tracking. So keep that in mind. If you see that a sale happened at $85, the sticker price, sticker price doesn't have anything to do with the cost that we've been tracking. So that's going to be a straightforward journal entry. We've seen in the past the first half of the sale would be a debit to accounts receivable if we sold it on account. And that would increase the receivable, the assets, and a credit to the income account, 35700 uh, 35, being 420 times 85, increasing revenue. That is going to be the same transaction we've seen in the past. Just remember that when you see that sales price, that sales price doesn't have anything to do with the cost worksheet. What does? Well, now we need to figure out the second half of the journal entry where we reduce inventory and, and calculate the cost of goods sold and record the cost of goods sold. We need to know what that number is. How much do we reduce it by? For that, we need our worksheet. And this part's really straightforward in terms of the average method because we already calculated the average in this case where we said it was the 54 units so we're all the units we sold which in this case are 420 are going to be meh, about 54 dollars meaning we have the cost of goods sold of 22,600 uh, 680 that's going to be the cost of goods sold that leaves us with remember we had a total of 500 units minus the 420 80 units and they all still cost meh, about 54 dollars 80 times the 54 means that we're left with 4,320. That's the total that's going to be left. Therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to record the cost of goods sold transaction for the 22,680, reducing inventory, recording cost of goods sold. Then we'll be left with an ending inventory on the trial balance of 4,320. Let's see that process. Second piece of the transaction will reduce the inventory by that 22,680, reducing inventory from 27,000 by the 22,682, that 4,320. Second half of it, cost of goods sold being the debit, the expense side of the transaction, bringing cost of goods sold up to that 22,680. The point now is that that 4,320 is what is represented on the trial balance and is backed up by our inventory worksheet for the dollar amount for those 80 units that are left.